Sports program is brought to you in living color. Hi, I'm Joe Garagiola in New York. And I'm Sandy Koufax in Pittsburgh. And it's our pleasure to welcome you to the very first night game in World Series history. <laughs> Series Report 71 with Joe Garagiola and Sandy Koufax. Brought to you by Texaco and the many thousands of Texaco retailers and distributors in all 50 states. Trust Texaco to have the right gasoline Good for you. What an evening this figures to be. Since 1935, when the very first Major League night game was played in Cincinnati, night baseball has become an important part of the baseball scene. Since 1903, the World Series has been America's number one sports event. And tonight, for the very first time, the two come together. And in the next half hour, Sandy and I invite you to join us for some looks at yesterday's third game of this year's World Series. We're going to visit with some of the men who have helped the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Baltimore Orioles get into this year's World Series. And then a special trip into the world of the umpires, including a chance to see what kind of an umpire you would make. And then we're going to have a special visit from two old friends, Bob and Ray. You know, some players prefer to play night games, while others like Ernie Banks of the Chicago Cubs, well, he says things like, the time to play this game is during the day. And sometimes I think that's the real reason the Lord invented sunshine. Well, now, to me, it really didn't make too much difference. You see, the evenings were just a little bit cooler, and that changed my game plan a little bit because I had to take a jacket to the bullpen. And I'm just wondering, about Sandy Koufax, but first I do want to ask Sandy, Sandy, do we need a jacket tonight because of the weather? Joe, it's been a very pleasant day, and they say it's going to be a pleasant evening temperature-wise. Uh, forecast, 55, 60 degrees. The only problem is they're also forecasting a 30 to 40 percent chance of rain, and uh, that could cause a problem. We're hoping that it'll be later tonight before the rain shows up here in Pittsburgh. Sandy, what about a night game? Uh, what, did you rather pitch at night or during the day? Well, I think uh, as you started to talk about it, uh, I think the weather played a big factor in that. Uh, being a pitcher, you get to July and August in the east, it's very hot and humid sometimes. You prefer the evening because it was easier to keep your stuff. A lot of hitters, I think, prefer to play during the day. Maybe for that reason, maybe they see the ball better. How about the catcher's signals? After all, you know, the catcher's got to lead you pitchers through it, and you have to see the signals. Did you see them at night? Did you have any problems? Well, sometimes on the road you could have a little bit of a problem because of the gray uniform, it being a little tougher to see from the mound. But I've known that there are some pitchers who've had problems seeing the catcher's signs all the time. Hey, I discussed that, Sandy, with an old teammate of yours, Joe Pignatano, a catcher with you, and now he's a coach with the New York Mets, just wondering. Did you have any problems with pitchers who didn't see the ball or see your finger signs? Yes, Joe, uh, I did, uh, especially in the Coliseum. The Coliseum was bad. The lighting was real bad. And uh, Drysdale, he used to give me his, he used to give me what he was going to throw. I never called him. He called him. And he'd walk up to the rubber. We'll use this as the rubber. He, and he'd go like this. That was his fastball. And if he was knocking dirt from his cleats, that was his curveball. And he threw his changeup off his fastball. Did he move you at all behind the plate? He, he couldn't shake you off because he was calling the pitches. Right, yeah, Joe. He did. Uh, he shook his head, but only because I was sitting inside and he wanted the ball outside or vice versa. But that's the only time he shook his head. Man, I wish some of my pitches had done that. I mean, call their own game. That would have saved me a lot of embarrassing moments because managers would always start with the same line. Hey, dummy, how could you call for a fastball in a spot like that? You know... As I watched the third game of the World Series yesterday, I couldn't help thinking about the different styles of the players that I was watching. It made me wonder if baseball is what singers have in mind when they sing about the games people play. Roberto Clemente. They say this is the worst looking, best hitter in baseball. Look at him screw himself into the ground. Need a pair of pliers to get him out of there. A good bad ball hitter. Strike zone is any ball he can reach. Here's Manny saying, Gian, I like his style of just reaching for the ball. Forget the body, there's the bat on the ball. Nice little polite single. May have done it the artificial turf. Just reaches. They say you should get your body into it. 
Watch this fellow, Frank Robinson. This is a hitting clinic. Perfect swing. Every ounce into the swing. Look at the follow through. Perfect. This is Bob Robertson. Watch the top half of his body, all strength. When he goes into it, look at those arms. Belong in a baking soda box. Power. On this base hit, I'm going to show you a classic slide. Hook slide away from the infielder. Brooks Robinson, though, this is not classic. Almost historical, that was an air. Of course, that was a classic head first slide. With a little half gainer by Oliver. Here it is in slow motion. It'll give you heartburn the hard way. At third base, going back, watch the helmet come off, and this is when he gets a kneecap sandwich. This is where it has to hurt. Robinson's knee hit Oliver, put a Windsor knot right on his nose. Classic pitcher yesterday, Steve Blass. Fastball in the outside corner, strike one. The thing to watch here is where he puts the ball. Outside corner. If he could pitch there all the time, low and outside, he'd go to Hall of Fame on a one-way ticket. This next pitch is a fastball. Couldn't hit this with four bats. Perfect pitch. That'll make a broadcaster out of you quicker than any pitch I know. Hitting is timing, and pitching is upsetting the timing. Now, that was a slow curveball. Watch it in slow motion. Way out in front. Big boot pile. And there is Steve Blass. He's congratulating everybody in sight. He's heading for the clubhouse, and he's heading for an interview, which is not too unusual when you win a World Series ball game. But for an unusual interview, I'll tell you something. You just stay right where you are. The American Family on the Road. A grand sight. Automatic transmission for convenience. Air conditioned for comfort. Trailing a camper. Or a boat or a roof piled high with luggage. All that extra load forces your engine to work a lot harder and hotter, more than 50 degrees hotter than normal. And when your engine is running this hot, it can literally cook the motor oil and begin to destroy it. When it cools, it can become a solidified sludge-like material that could ruin your engine and your trip. That's why Texaco engineers developed Haviland's super premium all-temperature motor oil. It won't break down under the grueling strain of hot long-distance driving. So before you and the family cruise off into the sunset, Get a crankcase full of Haviland Super Premium All-Temperature Motor Oil. It's like buying travel insurance for sustained long-distance driving. So, for products you can trust, trust your car to the man who wears the Texaco Star. Coverage of the World Series by all parts of the media is tremendous. And that's why we feel very lucky to have with us one of America's top reporters and a very special guest. In keeping with a big event like the first World Series night game, we've arranged to have with us Bob and Ray's ace reporter, Wally Ballou. He's standing by with an in-depth interview with one of baseball's fading stars. Lee Ballou with my pregame guest, the grizzled veteran of some 20-odd years of baseball, who's retiring this season. And I speak, of course, of Stuffy Hodgson. Stuffy, how do you feel? Well, I feel uh, pretty sad, naturally, after all these years to realize that this is the last campaign pretty sad I think that's a pretty uh, normal reaction to have after a career like yours a normal way to feel but uh, still at all you got to admit the game has been pretty good to you well not as good to me as some of these young punks that are coming along well now I sense a note of rancor in that uh, stuffy what do you mean exactly well uh, when I first came up here playing the game was everything sure you get paid for it but uh, the kids now all they care about is the big bonus and the big salary and the big cars and the big homes Beautiful women, vintage wines, making TV commercials and movies, and uh, sleeping late in the morning. Looks like uh, guys like you went wrong somewhere along the line, doesn't it? 
Well, like I say, this game passed me by somewhere. Now, uh, these kids, they all have these uh, little radios going in the locker room all day, playing a bunch of noise. Now, I don't understand that kind of music. Whatever happened to the songs that uh, Kate Smith and Pat Boone sang? I mean, those guys sang real songs. Well, I don't know much about uh, music, Stuffy, but I do know one thing, that uh, you managed to keep your sense of humor. You have to. I think that's uh, very important. As a matter of fact, that sense of humor has made you a big uh, demand speaker on the banquet circuit. Could you tell us one of those stories? Well, I'd like to. Uh, Wally, sure. I always remember the first time I came up to bat in the big leagues. Uh, I was just a kid, of course, and uh, I was nervous. And uh, they had a big left-hander out on the mound that day. Do you remember him? Yeah, I remember him well. Well, he was, uh, he was throwing real smoke that day. I couldn't see those pitches go by me. And uh, the umpire back of the plate. Do you remember him? A great big guy. Big guy, yeah. Well, he's to strike three, you're out. See? So, uh, like I say, I was a kid, nervous and everything. I took my bat and I threw it straight up in the air. Well, the umpire took off his mask and he comes over to me and he says, a young man, I was a young man then, he says, a young man, if that bat comes down, you're out of the game. <laughs> The kids don't have jokes and anecdotes like that anymore. No, I guess uh, I guess they don't. Tell me this. Uh, I know over the years you've come to be known as a guy who didn't take uh, too much care of his diet, <clears throat> didn't look out for what he ate or drank or how much, and still at all, you look to be in pretty good shape. Uh, how do you account for that? Well, looks can be deceiving, uh, Wally. Uh, actually, I haven't felt good for a couple of years. Oh, is that so? What do you mean? Well, I'm uh, suffering from uh, chronic garagiola. Well, what is that exactly? Well, uh, in addition to a low back pain, it's the persistent inability to hit a pitch ball with a bat. You see. Now, over these past uh, 20 years, Stuffy, you must have seen a lot of changes take place in the game. Could you tell us about one that seems to stand out? Well, uh, this uh, artificial turf, you know, you have uh, turned the game around. You have uh, your infielders back there to make a play. The ball takes these crazy hops and jumps up and hits them here on a clavicle or something. No, no, you've got to have ground to play this game on. Dig in and make a play. Well, listen, you better dig in and make a play. If you don't dig in and make a play, you're not going to win this game. And that goes for both teams, regardless. I guess so. Do you think now they're going to retire your number? No, they got some young punk wearing it over here now. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been given a speed-up signal. I want to ask you one more question. It must be a real thrill to be here at this historic first night World Series game. Yes, it is a real thrill. But it's just another ball game. He said that like a real ball player, just another ball game. Bob and Ray got hit on a clavicle. I know what a clavicle is. It's right there. Hey, for the men you'll see playing tonight, though, in tonight's ball game, their training ground went from the sand lots to the minor leagues. But there'll also be some men on the field who went through a different kind of training. Watch this. What are those guys doing, you figure? Oh, that's nice, guys. Foul ball. Okay. That's what they like to call. You know, once they've learned the three R's of uh, umpire, and I think there are three R's. We used to have reading, writing, and arithmetic. They got uh, rule books, right decision, and running catchers out of the game. Sometimes they need help. Isn't that easy? Now, Lou DeMuro, his eyes were all right. His ears might have been deceiving. He thought the ball hit the bat. Frank Robinson said it hit his leg. The camera shows you where it hit. But Lou DeMuro didn't have that camera. Listen to this. possible he ever tagged you. No way! Get out of here! You were in the way! Get out of there! You were right here and he knocked you over and went around. There's no way possible, Kenny. You never, there's no way you can even see the Kenny, I said he tagged him. How could you see if he tagged him, Kenny? When you were knocked out. Huh? Tell you. Kenny, you were knocked down. How can you call him out? I said he tagged him. That's it. The show that, I promise you that. From last year's World Series, diction and grammar was perfect. Now watch this. What motivates an umpire? This is a peaceful sight. And then look out. 
Now watch the umpire. He's going to be the peacemaker. But he's smart enough never to take off his mask. And then self-preservation. Sometimes an umpire doesn't make a decision. Watch him try to sneak in there. Now. Oops, got in the back door through the servant's entrance. Hey, now, have you ever sat in a ballpark and you booed an umpire's decision? What's coming up is especially for you, even if you haven't booed anybody. Let's find out right now what kind of an umpire you'd make. Remember now, you're the umpire, and we want a decision, and we want it right now. The umpire has to make his decision right away. Watch. What is he? Uh-huh, you called it too soon. Okay, here's another one. Safer out. Gotta wait. Watch this. What'd you call it? He was safe. Well, how'd you do? You have a better appreciation now of the umpire's job? But to be completely honest, we kind of pick those plays. Not every call is that tough. Sometimes you get all set for a real close call, one of those bang-bangs, and it turns out to be an easy one. Watch this one. <laughs> that umpire was very Italian, wasn't he? Hey, in just a minute, it'll be time to talk to some of the people most directly concerned in this year's World Series. The guys who are looking for a winner's share. Welcome to the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. Curtain time is still hours away. While it's quiet, Texaco, the company that has been broadcasting the opera for over 30 years, would like to take you on a tour of the house. Behind the scenes, the hundreds of details that go into each performance are carefully pulled together. Detailed set designs, costumes, lights, props, all to enhance the pleasure of you, the opera audience. We hope having seen this will add to your listening pleasure when our Texaco radio broadcasts begin again on December 11th. Well, right here, it's time to talk to the man who hit the big home run for the Pittsburgh Pirates yesterday, Bob Robertson, and a couple of fellows who know what it's like to be the winning pitcher in the World Series, Pittsburgh's Steve Blass and our own Sandy Koufax. Thank you, Joe. And since it seems that most people would like to see the long ball in baseball, let's talk to the man who hit the home run. Bobby, first of all, you hit that on a, on a bunt play. You were supposed to be sacrificing. There's very little chance of your being fined by Danny Murtaugh, is there? No, uh, there wasn't any indication that I was going to be fined yesterday. Danny didn't say anything after the game about it. He just smiled a little bit. But in a very important series like this, whenever you make a mental mistake like I did, uh, I think you should be fined. But uh, the way things have turned out, I think it was for the best. I don't think anybody would argue, uh, most of all, Steve Blass. What about this ballpark? This is the first night game in World Series history. A lot of hitters have said that they have trouble seeing the ball at night. They only see the top half of the ball. What are the lighting conditions in this new Pittsburgh park? We have wonderful lighting here. I don't think it's going to make any difference whether uh, playing at night here. Uh, I don't think it's going to make any difference to the pitchers or to the hitters, especially uh, uh, 
in this ballpark. We got good lights, and uh, uh, the rest of the stadiums in the league, uh, some of them aren't as good as we have here. Uh, so I don't expect any trouble as far as singing ball at home plate. What about the pitcher for the Orioles tonight, Pat Dobson? I think you faced him when he was at San Diego. Uh, did you hit him well? What do you expect? I guess your whole ball club probably knows him. Dobson, uh, well, he has the same type of stuff that uh, Palmer has for Baltimore. Uh, he doesn't throw as hard, but he's got the same type of breaking pitch. Uh, he has come up with a palm ball, an off-speed pitch, which he uses a, a great deal. So uh, I'm looking forward to a, a real good battle tonight between the pitchers and the hitters. What about hitting in this ballpark at night? Does the ball carry not quite as well here in the evening as it does during the day? I don't think the ball is going to carry as good tonight as it did uh, yesterday in the ball game. But uh, if uh, I get a hold of one or any other hitters get a hold of one, if you hit it good enough, it's going to go out. It doesn't make any difference about the win. Well, I know you're strong enough to hit it out of anywhere. And thank you very much, and good luck to you. And I'm going to talk to your partner over here, Steve Blass, for a while. Steve, first of all, congratulations on yesterday's game. It's I think one of the finest I've seen in the series, one of the finest I've seen all year. It looked like you had great stuff and great control all through the game. Yeah, it was a good ball game, and thank you very much. Uh, I'll pay Robertson's fine. Any fine he gets, I'll take care of the, uh, the tab on it. Uh, I felt better as the ball game went along because uh, I wound up having three pitches to work on, and, and uh, usually during a ball game, you wind up discarding a pitch along the way or, or going to another pitch, but... All three of them uh, were really working well for me, so I stayed with them, and I think this helped me stay strong. I, d I just didn't have to try to throw the fastball by them all the time. What about the scouting report on Baltimore? I know sometimes a team gets a scouting report, and a pitcher looks at it and has to make a change in what he's going to do or how he's going to try and pitch. Well, we got a, a very uh, thorough scouting report, and I, I would say, like all scouting reports, it was pretty accurate, but... Uh, you also can't get away from your own style of pitching. So I stayed mainly with the way I know I can pitch. Uh, uh, I made a couple of notes on a couple of the things that I saw during the first two games, but seeing a ball club for two games doesn't really tell you a lot because uh, Saturday they hit the long ball, and then the, in the second game they just hit a lot of singles. So uh, I was kind of caught in the middle. I didn't know whether they'd be swinging for the long ball or trying to just uh, hit the ball straight away and get on base. So I, uh, I just uh, tried to go with the way I have to pitch. Could you give me just a little quick rundown on Luke Walker, tonight's pitcher? Yes, I can. Uh, of all the pitchers on our staff, Luke by far has the best stuff, the best natural ability. He's got a fastball that uh, he doesn't turn over to be a sinker or he doesn't cut it so much, but his fastball is really live, and it's liable to go either direction, which makes it really tough. And he's got a very explosive curveball, uh, I think uh, similar to the one you used to throw. Uh, and he's, he's overpowering. When he's right, uh, he just overpowers a ball club. Well, that's great. Thank you, Steve. Good luck to you. We're looking forward to seeing you possibly Saturday in Baltimore. Now let's go back to Joe in New York. Okay, Sandy, that big Robertson talking about missing the bunt, that's become the great play of baseball. He's missed the bunt a couple times and then pop one right out of the ballpark. Those big sluggers never get the bunt sign. That's the problem. When they do get the bunt sign, shock sets in. Because the bunt sign is the easiest uh, sign in, in the world. At Pittsburgh, for example, this was our bunt sign. We had a letter on our cap when you covered it with the right hand. We're playing the Dodgers one day. First and second, nobody out. Seventh place hitter is up, right? Everybody knows he should bunt. Our coach goes to here and goes through all this, which means absolutely nothing. And our guy backs out of the box and gives it this. No, I ain't got it. I ain't got it. So all of a sudden, our coach very deliberately goes through it again, gets to here, Goes down slowly. Our guy's going, I ain't got it, I ain't got it, I ain't got it. Finally, the coach is standing just like this, whistles. <whistles> goes like that, and our guy's going, I ain't got it. Preacher Roll, pitcher for Brooklyn, says, want you to bunt. B-U-N-T. Not that tough a play. You know what's tough? Is getting a bunt sign so the pitcher can knock the guy in. That's tough. Whether you drive a mini compact, a medium sized car, or a magnificent limousine, you can trust Texaco to have great gasolines exactly right for you. Especially designed for better performance and for cleaner air. Gasolines with one of the most advanced additive packages in any gasoline you can buy. Visit a Texaco retailer for a great gasoline that's exactly right for you. 
You can trust your car to the man who wears the star. The big, bright, Texaco star. Sandy, we've been having some fun trying to pick the star of the game before it's even played. Uh, you did a great job yesterday. Congratulations, you picked Steve Blass. So uh, what does your crystal ball say tonight, left-hander? Well, thank you, Joe. I think tonight I'm going to have to go with Paul Blair. Uh, with the left-hander Luke Walker pitching, uh, Blair should be in center field tonight. He was last year's leading hitter in the series. He hasn't appeared in it yet, so uh, I think Paul's due for a good night. There may be another change up, a change in the Baltimore lineup. I'm not sure whether Boog Powell or Don Buford will be playing for Baltimore this evening. So you have Blair, and I'll tell you, I'm going to be a little upset on you. I've been watching the Baltimore catchers. I like the way they're handling their pitchers. I'm going to pick Dobson because the catchers will lead them through. All right. Uh, figures that an old catcher would lay it all on the catchers. If Dobson <laughs> does it, it's probably going to be to his credit. Well, there you see. The ticket for game number four, the World Series. And I don't care who the ball player is. That's, for him, the biggest thrill. I know for me, 1946, to play in the World Series. But only nine guys can play on each side. During the World Series, Sandy Koufax and I have had some fun trying to pick the star of the game. We've each made some good picks. We've made some bad picks. But there's one problem with that. We're pretty much limited to the players in the starting lineups, only nine guys on both sides. And we're overlooking a lot of the guys. Each of these guys contributed to his team being there. Yet some of them may not get to play a single inning in the World Series. And I guarantee you that every team that ever played in the World Series included guys that a spotlight never got around to. So Sandy and I didn't want to let this World Series pass by without giving a salute to some of the guys who not, well, they didn't make the headlines, but I'll guarantee you they made contributions to getting the headliners into that World Series. So we salute you guys. And of course, I'm getting set to watch the ball game, and I want to ask Wally Ballou and Stuffy, who are you picking, Wally? Well, I think I'm going to pick Baltimore. Uh... Joe. How about old stuff? Well, I, you know, I think I'll go with Pittsburgh because they're playing here in the friendly confines of Forbes Field. <laughs> well, let's just sit back and watch just another ball game. World Series Report 71 has been brought to you by Texaco and the many thousands of Texaco retailers and distributors in all 50 states. Trust Texaco to have the right gasoline for you. And now stay tuned following station identification for game number four of the 1971 World Series. Golden Triangle of Pittsburgh, and there's a light on tonight. The fourth time in the history of the city of Pittsburgh as all the office buildings have their lights on to celebrate the first night game in the history of the World Series. Here on the banks of the Monongahela, the Alleghenies, they join to form the Ohio River. And you're moving now into one of the most beautiful new parks in baseball, Three River Stadium. Yes, sir. Welcome to Three River Stadium as NBC Sports, a service of NBC News, presents Game 4 of the 1971 World Series. The American League champions, the Baltimore Orioles, versus the National League champions, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Brought to you by Chrysler Corporation, Extra Care and Engineering, your host tonight, your local Dodge dealer. By the two-bladed razor, the new Gillette Track 2 Twin Blade Cartridge Shaving System. And by Phillips 66, the performance company. At Phillips 66, it's performance that counts. Hi, everybody. I'm Kurt Gowdy of NBC Sports. This is Bob Prince, the broadcaster of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And my NBC Game of the Week partner, Tony Kubek, will be roaming the stands tonight with his comments. 
And for our first night game, we have a beautiful night. 72 degrees here. It's warm enough to, well, you don't need a, a sweater or top coat tonight. Not much wind. And you know, it seemed odd today to be standing around a hotel lobby in the afternoon waiting for the World Series at night. We've had 397 World Series games played before this one, all in the daytime. And here we are. And we're glad you could be with us, all of us at NBC, and you fans not only across America, but around the world for this historic event. Now, let's move over here to Bob Prince of the Pirates, as they won yesterday to get back into the series. Bob, you've been with the Pirates a long time. You were in their clubhouse after the game yesterday and today. What's the feeling of the Pirate team now? Well, Kurt, after two crushing defeats at the hands of the Baltimore Orioles, and of course they were really crushed in game two, they felt they turned the momentum of the Baltimore club around a little bit and gained some of their own. They picked up a lot of confidence, and the result is that they're raring to go in this game tonight. And, of course, the Orioles, well, they seem to win graciously, and they lose graciously. Not much to say. They had a 16-game winning streak snap. And in this ballpark, you're going to see here tonight the largest crowd in the history of Pittsburgh baseball. Yes, yeah, standing room only. Only 1,000 seats went on sale at 6 o'clock, and they were gobbled up real quick. The Pirates have played well at home. They led the National League in home victories with the artificial turf. How about the lighting here, Bob? That might be a bit of a problem to the center fielder, particularly for Baltimore. They're not used to it. It's a different angle on the lights, and it could cause him some trouble on balls that are lined right directly at the center fielder. And we've had a couple of changes. Right-hander Paul Blair goes to the outfield to start in place of Buford tonight for Baltimore. A right-handed hitting catcher, Etchebarron, will be behind the plate. Danny Murtaugh has Hebner and Oliver, left-handed batters, in his lineup to try and get as many lefties as possible. Let's take a look now at the starting pitchers for tonight's game. And right now you're looking at the Baltimore right-hander, Pat Dobson. He was acquired in an off-season trade last winter from San Diego to strengthen the Baltimore depth. And strengthen them he did as he became a 20-game winner. Baltimore became the second team in the history of Major League Baseball to come up with four 20-game winners. Pat Dobson for Baltimore. From New Boston, Texas, James Luke Walker. Luke Walker won 10 games and lost eight. He has not pitched since September 22nd. Dobson has not started a game since September 24th. The two of them might be question marks tonight. Yes, that's very possible. One thing, uh, Chris, uh, I would say this, Kurt, they don't like to try to catch this fellow because he moves the ball all over the plate. If he can get it over, he's very tough to uh, whip, and you might see some pop-ups and ground balls tonight. And now let's go down to Tony Kubek. The first night game in World Series history, one of the men responsible, the commissioner of baseball, Bowie Q and Mr. Commissioner, one of the most exciting highlights in baseball history today. It is a historic first, really, Tony. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about it because I think it's going to produce, my prediction is it will produce the greatest television audience for a sports event in the history of sports. I look for over 60 million Americans to be tuned in. I think they're out there now. And uh, we have uh, over 1,000 people from the various sports media here covering the game. There's been nothing like that in the history of sports. It's an enormous event. What about plans or future plans for World Series play? Well, we are so satisfied that this single night game is the right thing to do, that next year we're going to have the three weekday games on at night so that you'll have Saturday and Sunday day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. And that way, the fans of America, the people who work, the kids in school can see the whole thing if they want to. Mr. Commissioner, a packed house here tonight. What about, of course, this ball game tonight? And I'm going to ask you for a prediction. Well, I don't make predictions in the World Series or almost any other time, but I understand you did, and Stanley, I understand you picked the Pirates in seven. Well, I just feel that the uh, Baltimore Orioles team is going to have to start scoring some runs because Pirates look like they're going to start hitting the ball around. Well, the Pirates can hit, and Baltimore has got tremendous pitching. As commissioner, I usually take the position I'll be happy to see seven games and settle for whoever wins in those seven. Louis Kuhn, Mr. Commissioner, thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Let's go back upstairs. All right, we're going to have the starting lineups announced to you very shortly. We have been entertained here before the game by the Pittsburgh Welcome University Band, and now let's meet both teams. Game of the 1971 World Series. Here are the official lineups, and let's have a big Pittsburgh welcome as they're introduced. First, the American League champions, the Baltimore Orioles. Here is the manager of the Orioles, number four, Earl Weaver. 
Batting first and playing center field, number six, Paul Blair. Batting second. Batting second and playing shortstop, number seven, Mark Belanger. Batting third and playing left field, number 14, Merv Ruttenmund. Batting fourth and playing right field, number 20, Frank Robinson. Batting fifth and playing third base, number five, Brooks Robinson. Batting sixth and playing first base, number 26, Boob Powell. Batting seventh and playing second base, number 15, Dave Johnson. Batting eighth and catching, number eight, Andy Etcheverin. Batting ninth and pitching, number 37, Pat Dobson, who is warming up in the bullpen. And here are the remaining players and coaches of the Baltimore Orioles. Don Buford, Mike Playar, Clay Dalrymple, Jerry DeVenon, Tom Dukes, Dick Hall, Elrod Hendricks, Grant Jackson, Dave Leonard, Kurt Moten, Dave McNally, Jim Palmer, Pete Rickard, Chico Simone, Tom Chopay, Eddie Watt, and coaches, Jim Fry, Billy Hunter, and George Stoller. Now for the National League champions, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Here's the manager of the Pirates, number 20, Danny Murtaugh. Batting first and playing second base, number 30, Dave Cash. Batting second and playing third base, number 20, Richie Hefner. Batting third, playing right field, number 21, Roberto Clemente. Batting fourth, playing left field, number eight, Willie Stargell. Batting fifth and playing center field, number 16, Al Oliver. Batting sixth and playing first base, number seven, Bob Robertson. Batting seventh and catching, number 35, Manny Sandian. Batting eighth and playing shortstop, number two, Jack Hernandez. Batting ninth and pitching, number 23, Luke Walker, who is warming up in the bullpen. And here are the remaining players and coaches of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Gene Alley, Steve Blass, Nelson Bryles, Gene Kleins, Vic Davalio, Doc Ellis, Dave Justy, Bob Johnson, Bruce Keeson, Milt May, Bill Mazeroski, Bob Miller, Bob Moose, Jose Pagan, Charlie Sands, and Bob Veal, and coaches Don Leppard, Frank Osiak, Don Osborne, Dave Ricketts, and Bill Verdon. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for our national anthem, which will be sung by Mildred Miller, Metropolitan Opera Star.
of the meeting at home plate, and Earl Weaver is back on the scene. He let the uh, Baltimore coach, George Stoller, take the lineup out one day after the Orioles had been in a losing streak. The Orioles won 16 in a row, so Weaver let his coach go out every day, but they lost yesterday, so Weaver, number four now, is back out with a lineup card. And now the ceremonial first pitch of game four, and the honor goes to one of the all-time greats of the National League, Stan Musial, a Hall of Famer, seven-time National League batting champ, 3,630 hits in his career and a lifetime batting average of 331. That's his wife alongside Lillian Musial. And on Stan's left, Bing Crosby, one of the owners of the Pirates, along with Mr. John Dalbreth, the uh, principal owner. And of course, right here from Pennsylvania, Stan Musial is from Denora, Pennsylvania, where he was born and reared. There's Bing. So the fourth game of the 1971 World Series being brought to you from Pittsburgh as the Baltimore Orioles meet the Pittsburgh Pirates. I'll do the umpire, turn it over to Bob for the defense. Six umpires assigned to World Series games. Tonight behind the plate, Ed Bargo, who lives in Butler, Pennsylvania, by the way, about 30 miles from Pittsburgh. Jim Odom working at first base. John Kibler at second base. Nestor Shylock at third base. Umpiring the left field line will be Ed Sudall, and the right field line will be handled by John Rice, who was born in Homestead, Pennsylvania, suburb of Pittsburgh. There go the Pirates on the field. We'll take a look at the electronic scoreboard here and set them up defensively for you. Stargell's in left field for Pittsburgh. Oliver's in center field. Flamini right field. Third base is Hebner. Shortstop will be Hernandez. The second baseman is Cash. The first baseman is Robertson. Sanguian is the Pittsburgh catcher. And Luke Walker will be starting tonight for the Pirates. That's Luke Walker warming up. And to tell you about Luke and take you along with the detailed play-by-play -play action of the first half of this game, the very popular and competent broadcaster of the Pittsburgh Pirates, Mr. Bob Prince. Thank you very much, Kurt Gowdy, and hello again, everybody. Now you see Luke Walker warming up here and in slow motion. He's right over the top, as you can see. And one of the very rare things about him, he cannot throw a ball straight. There isn't anybody on the Pirate Ball Club that likes to warm him up, including the catcher. He does not know where that ball is going to go. It can run in and away from any type of batting. And normally when he's right, you'll see a lot of pop-ups, strikeouts, and certainly an awful lot of ground balls. Now, as pointed out a little earlier, he has pitched 12 no-hitters in high school, and he attended uh, Paris Junior College in Paris, Texas, and Texarkana Junior College. This is his ninth pro season. Began with the Boston Red Sox organization. And on the year for 1971, he won 10 and he lost eight. 
His last game he pitched on September the 22nd. He worked six innings against the Cardinals and he helped clinch the division championship. Bob, it'll be interesting to see if the Orioles will be taking against him. He has a history of control problems. Yes, he definitely has that. Now, here's one of manager Earl Weaver's. Thank you. And enjoy the viewing. Paul Blair, Earl Weaver having made a bit of a switch, moving Blair, a fine outfielder, into center field. And the strike is there. They will now stop this game and give this ball to the commissioner of baseball, Bowie Kuhn. And that later will be then enshrined in the Hall of Fame. The commissioner of baseball now receiving that uh, baseball, and that'll be enshrined in the Hall of Fame where Ken Smith uh, presides. In Cooperstown, New York, the first pitch on the first night game of the World Series brought to you on NBC. 0-1 to Blair. Ran away from him a ball. Blair has one hit in the World Series. Went in defensively the other day, picked up a base hit. I'll tell you, Kirk, when Walker has it going, he has a snake coming in at that plate. That's what the ball players say. Very sneaky. Ball moves all the time. The outfield around to the left for Paul Blair, who on the regular season hit 10 home runs. Ball two strike two. Clemente is playing about 90 feet off the line. There you see the alignment in the infield and the outfield. Stargell to deep left. It is 340 down both lines here at Three River Stadium. 385 in the slots and 410 straight away. Ball off this synthetic turf really comes off quickly. Two balls, two strikes. And he just got a piece of it, and there you saw that ball running on him. And absolutely no win tonight. The flag hanging limp in center field. So the breeze is not a factor right now in this game. There you see old glory. Two balls, two strikes to Paul Blair. Batted 262 for the regular season and truly one of the great center fielders in baseball. Fouled away and there you saw him hit over the ball, bouncing and foul off to the left. Luke Walker, Kurt, got off a great line a couple of years ago before he went on to win 15 games. Somebody re interviewed him and he said, tell my mother I'm alive and well, but not pitching in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Then he went on to win 15 games. Ball two, strike two. And it's a base hit into the slot in left center. Oliver coming on, and so Blair continues to bat 1,000 in the series, his second hit in as many at-bats. He hit a curveball. Now the very fine shortstop of the Baltimore Orioles, Mark Belanger, batting 200 in the World Series. On the regular season, went for 266. No homers, 35 runs batted in. Been quite a juggling in the lineup with regard to batting order. Belanger was batting eighth. Now up to the number two spot. Bounces off the right side. Cash a beautiful play, and he can't make it. Cash getting over to get to the ball. This has scored a base hit. Cash got to the ball. He was trying to shovel the ball from his glove to his shortstop. He's there, but as he got the ball out of his glove, it slipped away from him. That scored a base hit. Cash did a remarkable job getting to the ball to keep it from going through. So the Orioles have a quick threat already, top of the first inning. So at two on, here is Merv Rettman batting at 231. One home run and four runs batted in on the series. You saw a flash there on the screen. His Average for the year. Ball. You'll see a lot of balls pop in and out of the mitt of many San Gian tonight as long as Walker is on. And there is early activity in the Pirate bullpen. Bruce Keeson. Eddie Vargo of Butler, Pennsylvania, does a lot of work. He's the plate umpire with the George Junior Republic, which is a 
school for wayward boys, and it's been a very worthwhile endeavor. Does that, of course, in the offseason. One ball, one strike to Rettman. A bunt foul. One and two, and they're trying for the base hit, obviously. You wonder how sharp these two will be tonight with their control. Walker pitched last September 22nd. Dobson started on September 24th. That's quite a layoff. Redmond being played very definitely to pull. Now all off the first base side. On this synthetic turf, as Walker retrieves the ball there, the balls roll very true. And normally, if you get a pretty good shot out over second or short, it'll go all the way to the wall. And the outfielders here run to surround the ball, not cut it off. The Orioles play on only one artificial surface in the infield in the American League. That's at Comiskey Park, Chicago. But they say they like this artificial surface. One ball, two strikes. Two on, nobody out. Top of the first and no score. Mouncer for the hole, and Hernandez flags it down, and he has no play, but he saves a run. From the whole side of shortstop, Hernandez getting it on into second. Wide range here by Hernandez. And this ball really takes off like a jackrabbit on his hard artificial service. Throw too late at second base for the attempted force. And now the Orioles have the bases loaded, nobody out, and their cleanup batter, Frank Robinson, up. And Robinson batting at 583 in the series has two home runs, and both of his home runs have come with nobody aboard. But now, with the bases loaded, the Pirates will play the infield back. He's had seven base hits and 12 at bats. Outfield necessarily very deep and around to the left. Ball. In his last six series games, three this year and three last, he's had 13 base hits for a 5 a wild pitch and run will score as the other runners move up. Will away to ruling here. The ball get away from San Gian. The Orioles jump into the lead one to nothing. That's been scored a pass ball by the three official scorers, a low inside pitch that skipped off the mitt of San Gian. It wasn't an easy chance, but the scorers figure that he should have handled it. Now they're going to put Robinson on with first base open. Well, this started out when Paul Blair hit what appeared to be a hanging curveball for the base hit. And then Belanger picked up the base hit off the second base side of the diamond when Cash attempting to shovel the ball along over to Hernandez covering there to get the out and did not. Now here's another tough man, Brooks Robinson, batting 500 in the series. Hits and ten at bats. Base is loaded again. One run in and nobody out in the top of the first. One ball, no strikes. High fly into shallow center. Oliver coming up. Tagging at third is Belanger. And he's going to try to come in under a strong throw. And he's in there. And everybody moves up a notch. So Robinson makes it 2-0 on a long fly to center. Belanger scores the second run. Give Brooks Robinson a run batted in. Move Rettman over to third after the catch, and Robinson up to second base. And now the only left-hand batter in the Baltimore lineup stands in in Boog Powell. He's been playing this series with a hand and a half. He's not cutting the way he normally does. He has some torn tissue in the back of his right hand that is plaguing his swing. Powell batting only at 083. Just inside the ball. 
Orioles leading here 2 0 in the top half of the first inning. A ball. The Pirates are not shifting as much, but now Hernandez has moved in a little bit behind second. He was over on the third base side of second. Now you see the shift there. With a count of 2 0, oh, they've moved a little bit, figuring Powell have a better pitch to pull. hit very deep into center Oliver going way back and he's there and that'll score another run and now coming over to third on the play will be Frank Robinson they make the throw but he's in there wonder where he to hit that one with both hands healthy they might have had to flag it down somewhere west of the Allegheny and Bill Verdon is coming out They didn't like that last blast by Powell. And they're going to get the young right-hander now, Bruce Keeson in. Well, Bruce Keeson, as you'll recall, Kurt, had a very rocky time of it in game two. There's a break in the action here at Pittsburgh, and the score, Baltimore three, Pittsburgh nothing here in the first inning. on behalf of Major League Baseball. who is about six feet five. He says he weighs 185 pounds. There are those who doubt that. He pinched the final game in the, uh, or not the final game, but the big clinching game out there for a victory against the San Francisco Giants. When he came in in relief, pitched four and two-thirds innings, allowing only two hits, striking out three. His first outing against Baltimore was indeed a very rough one. He, Walked a couple of batters at the wrong time for him and the Pirates. The bases were loaded at the time. He's 21 years of age, born and lives in Pasco, Washington. He was 10 and 1 for Charleston when the Pirates brought him up, and in the major league season, six and five. Watch him throw there. The whiplash throw reminds you a little bit of Ewell Blackwell's delivery. It's about to say that sidearm stuff can be rough on right-handers. He goes to Dave Johnson, batting 2-5-0 in the series, and there's a bouncer to Hebner at third. On to Robertson, the inning is over. And so at the middle of the first inning, the score is Baltimore three, the Pirates coming to bat.
So Baltimore jumps on top, and now we'll set the Pirates defensively, for, or the Baltimore defensively. That's Merv Rettman in left field. Paul Blair in center. Frank Robinson in right field. At third base, Brooks Robinson. Shortstop, Mark Belanger. Dave Johnson at second base. Boog Powell at first base. Behind the plate, Andy Etchebaron. And on the mound is Pat Dobson, who won 20 and lost eight. Now, he, like Luke Walker, has not had a lot of work. And his last outing occurred on the 28th of September when he worked two innings in relief against Boston. His only relief appearance, by the way, of the year. He goes to Dave Cash, who's had two hits and 13 at bats. Batted 289 on the season. Ball. Dave is a thinking man's hitter. Outfield plays him shallow around to right. Bang, one and one. Dobson throws a fastball, a slider, a curveball, and his changeup is a palm ball. He has four different pitches. Ball one, strike one. Orioles lead 3 0 as Cash leads off for the Pirates in the first inning. Ball two. Patrick Edward Dobson, born in Buffalo, New York, now lives in Durham, North Carolina. His 12th professional season began in Detroit, by the way, in the organization there. Ball three. He, by the way, has allowed no runs in his last 11 innings. Three balls and a strike. He puts him on. Richie Hebner, batting 333 in the World Series, has one homer and three runs batted in. Came in a losing cause. He can pull ax a ball, and they play him way around to right. Ball. He was the first player here at the ballpark tonight. He arrived at 5 o'clock and took special batting practice. Unhappy that he didn't start yesterday, but Pagan, who replaced him, did a good job. One ball and no strikes. Now on your split screen, that's Cash at first base. High pop-up in the infield and shortstop Belanger settling under. One out. hero Roberto Clemente. He has hit safely in 10 World Series games. And he took 11 years to get that string going. 10 in 19, uh, or 1960 went for seven games and three thus far here, Kurt. I think it's great that the fans, uh, not only in this country, around the world can watch this fellow play. Nobody plays the game harder in every department. Strike. Now, as you see here with Boog Powell holding the cash and Johnson playing a little farther to his right, Clemente has a big hole on his favorite side of the diamond right field. They just continue to pitch him outside, and somehow or other, he continues to hit it about a 340 clip. One and one. He always looks like he slept in a bad mattress or pillow. He's always cricking that neck around as if he has a bad neck. Matter of fact, he claims he sleeps with his eyes open. He just says he can't sleep. He can hear the slightest tick, and he's wide awake. One ball, one strike. There's that palm ball. One and two. Willie Stargell on deck. Pirate dugout on the first base side. That's a walk-in dugout. One ball and two strikes. Cash leading off first with Boog Powell holding there. Orioles lead 3-0. One out here in the first. Now back. Took a little off that fastball that time, Kurt. 
pretty tough to fool Clemente on a change, by the way. And it was a high pitch. The Pirates were ninth in their league in receiving walks. They're a swinging team. They're not looking for walks. They come out of that dugout swinging, and the Baltimore pitching staff was the stingiest in the American League in giving up walks. Clemente, while he's played way around to right, can Polax the ball up the left field side. If he gets his pitch, he can take it down that way in a hurry. One ball, two strikes. And watching carefully, as you saw, Clemente has a habit of just going right out over the plate with his body and watching it right into the catcher's mitt. Two balls, two strikes. One out and one on. The Orioles lead 3 nothing in the bottom of the first. Time he picks him up on a strikeout, and that's the second out of the inning. First strikeout of the game. And now Willie Stargell. Now we see Davey Johnson playing a deep second to him. He's back on the synthetic turf. The outfield around to the right. There you see the infield, the way it is overshifted, and Belanger's not quite behind second but he's way over ball Stargell has hit quite a few home runs to the opposite field there is no park that can hold him when he gets his pitch turn that one over one and one Somewhere along the line, Bob, our director, Harry Coyle, might get that third tier, that upper tier in right field where he's hit two of the longest shots in the still young history of this park. Mm -hmm. A ball and a strike to Stargell. There's a base hit to right center field. It may be in the gap. It is. It's going to go in there and pass his pass. He's on his way. Ball is bobbled in right field by Robinson, but I don't believe it would have made any difference. On uh, the artificial surface, it scoots right through. Frank Robinson couldn't play the carom cleanly. And finally, it's the center fielder, Paul Blair, who picks it up and fires in. But Dave Cash is already into the dugout with a score. The Pirates are on the scoreboard, and Stargill's at second. And Al Oliver in there as we're back to live action. It's ball one to him. He's batting 100 in the series. Three to one now. Baltimore leading, and this could be a real big uh, scoring ball game. Al will be 25 years old tomorrow. One ball, one strike. Well, as you and I were talking earlier, Kurt, at the head of this uh, broadcast, anything hit on the line in between those outfielders, they don't run to cut it off. They run to just catch up to it. One ball, one strike. Ball two. Stargell, there's Robertson on deck. Stargell now seems to be getting back in the groove again. And if he is, it's going to be a big lift for the Pirates. There he is out at second base on a double. Fouled away. You know, Kurt, the Pirates all year long have been a great two out scoring ball club, and they uh, show some early signs here tonight. They normally get their runs in clusters. They hit a lot of back-to-back -back home runs. Two balls, two strikes. Ball three. The Orioles, with Dobson pitching, and perhaps, Kurt, it's because of the slow stuff, have swung their outfield around to the right. Most ball clubs in the National League do not play Oliver to pull this much. Now they're set over there about three or four strides to right center and right field. Fouled away. And look at Powell. He's almost on the first baseline. Mm -hmm. That's Stargell. He drove in the Pirates run. Sizzling double to right center field. Three and two to Oliver. 
Foul back. He's hanging tough. Dobson is pitching him inside, though. The Orioles know that. That's why they're playing Oliver Moore as a pull hitter. There you see the manner in which Boog Powell is playing, and Johnson well over to his own left at second base. Two men are away. It's three to one. The Orioles have the lead. Foul ball. And that time, you get it right off the end of the back. Just got the lacquer on it. Well, Oliver, you see two bills there. They all wear their protective cap on top, and then underneath. Of course, their cloth cap. Pirates will keep that protective cap on their heads while always on the base paths. Ball three and strike two to Oliver. Stardew leading off second base. And a foul ball. doubt about this being the largest crowd and what a thrill it is to join Kurt Gowdy and NBC in sending you the first night game in World Series history from Pittsburgh Pennsylvania here on NBC three balls two strikes step off the mound by Dobson Dobson holds the baseball in his glove will make his grip now and it's a bloop. Get out in the shallow center field, and they'll not get it. And it's over the head of Blair. And Oliver will go to second, and it's three to two. Now here's a new trend in baseball: the artificial surface. Watch the bounce on this. Texas leaguer that drops in normally on a grass outfield that would just dunk there but look at the high bounce and Paul Blair not used to playing on this surface the ball bounced over his head and that gives Oliver an extra base it has scored a double that's Earl Weaver who's come on the uh, Oriole now are getting their bullpen busy and it's a 3-2 game the Orioles came up with three in the top of the first the Pirates have come right back with two Dave Leonard is the right-hander, and Grant Jackson the left-hander. And of course, Kurt, the other advantage the Pirates had there, with two out, Stadio could run. With less than two out, he would have had to hold up on that one for fear the ball would be catchable. And that is part of the break of the game. And again, the Pirates are showing their two-out run-scoring ability, as Big Bob Robertson. And I suppose you know by now he missed the bunch sign yesterday and hit a three run homer. Into the dirt ball one. He didn't miss one bunch sign he missed two. Frank Oshiak the third base coach gave him two bunch signs and he didn't read either one. And he had a good excuse he said why would you ever ask me to bunt I've never bunted in my life. And I was 0 for 9 and I had to get a hold of something one ball no strikes. Ball two. Well, if you pitch this fellow, there's Frank Osiak. You pitch this Robertson away, he'll take you right out to right field. You get him in the wheelhouse, and the fans start to duck in left field. Two balls and no strikes. And he fouled it at the feet of Etchebarren. You know, with those two runners on, Bob, when he hit the home run, Flamini knew there was something wrong. Robertson missed the sign and he he was going to call time out or ask for time and Monty Urban of the baseball commissioner's offices here back in the 1950s he was on base got something in his eye asked for time just as the pitch was released the umpire of second called time out and Whitey Lockman hit a home run that didn't count and if Clemente had got the, the time and the pitch had been released Robertson would have lost the homer yesterday two balls and a strike and that is Oliver with a double out at second. He wheeled on that one, didn't he? Two and two. Pirates had that happen to them quite a long time ago. Frank Frisch was the manager. 
Pirates had a shortstop, Frankie Zack. He called time, and Ziggy Sears called it. Nobody heard him, and Jim Russell hit a home run. And then struck out. 2-2. Two -two. Hit slowly off the first base side. Dodson to Boog Powell. But the Buckos come back with two runs on two hits and leave a runner. And at the end of one, the score, Baltimore three and the Pirates two. On the left of your screen is Billy Hunter, born in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, known throughout the world as Groundhog City. The senior Baltimore coach, and he's in his eighth year. And on the right, George Stoller, born in Rutherford Heights, Pennsylvania, now lives in Harrisburg, the Commonwealth capital, managed in the minors for 14 years. And I think that pitching coach George Bamberger must be looking in, Kirk. A longtime friend of yours and a great coach for the Baltimore Orioles. That's right. He uh, suffered a heart attack. He's in a Baltimore hospital, recovering nicely, they say, and watching the World Series game tonight. So the Orioles are in the World Series without their pitching coach, who helped develop that staff of four 20-game winners, the first staff in the majors to win, to have four 20-game winners since the White Sox of 1921. And Kurt, in your game of the week coverage, uh, did not uh, Bamberger predict that Baltimore would have four 20-game winners? He predicted it early in the season, in April. Right on the nose, he called it. Here's Andy Atchebaran in his first appearance in the World Series of 1971. Batted 270, nine homers, 29 runs batted in. The pitcher is Bruce Keeson in relief of Luke Walker. A ball. Walker's log in two-thirds of an inning, three runs, three hits, no strikeouts, and one walk. This young man determines that he'll be married on the 17th of October, and he'd like to be late for his wedding. Bouncer down to catch. See how fast that ball got out there? On to Robertson, one out. Kurt was talking about it, I'm sure, over in Baltimore. Young Bruce Keeson and his bride-to-be announced their wedding plans as the 17th of October and found out about a week later that Game 7, if it goes that far, will be in Baltimore. And uh, Buckos would like to make it go 7 and let Keeson worry about the wedding later. This is Pat Dobson. Batted 110 on the year. Ball right on the corner. Now, Keeson has a good riding fastball and a wicked sinker and a ball that runs in many times on right-hand batters. Strike two. Last year in the International League, he hit 28 batters. I wonder how it feels to be 21 pitching in the first night game of World Series history. A ball. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I think he might have been nervous in Baltimore. That perhaps now has uh, disappeared. One ball, two strikes, one out. Baltimore leading 3-2 in the top of the second. Fouled away. There was that sinking pitch. There's Danny Murtaugh from Chester, Pennsylvania. Banjo eyes, we call him. He won the World Series in 1960 with the Buckos, and here, 11 years later, trying for another. Always excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he really jumps around, doesn't he? One ball, two strikes. Good night. Keeson has his first strikeout. And there are two away in the Baltimore second inning. There is Earl Weaver. 
And you can't say too much about him, Kurt Gowdy, a magnificent manager with a fantastic managing record. He's taken the Orioles three years in a row to at least 100 wins and still hasn't won the Manager of the Year award in the American League. Paul Blair, who singled in the first inning and scored. Ball one to him. Had 10 home runs on the regular season. Fouled away. Paul Blair, not Brooks Robinson, was the leading hitter in the 1970 World Series with a 4.74 average. Time has been called, and that was called by Blair. Strike two. Look at that baby face, Kurt. 21 years of age. Two and two. He's even shaking off the signs tonight. You ask him if he weighs 185 pounds, and he'll challenge you. He looks like a stick, doesn't he? He said he built that body without lifting a weight. Ball two, strike two. Little bloop off the end of the bat might drop. It will. Watch Clemente now get tripped by it also. And uh, throw back into second, and Blair has his third hit in as many at bats in the World Series. Hit it right off the end of the bat and blooped it in there. And Clemente, that time, obviously was fooled. I think Clemente had ideas of making a diving shoestring uh, grab for this, and then at the last two or three feet, had to give up. The ball bounced over his head. That's the second one on the artificial turf that has bounced over a charging outfielder, and it's a double for Paul Blair. Been some peculiar base hits thus far. The Orioles have had uh, two infield singles and a bloop double, and the Pirates have uh, had a bloop double. Mark Belanger, who picked up an infield single in the first inning. Orioles lead 3-2 to two here in the second inning. Two out. No balls and a strike. Strike two. Boy, he's not only sneaky fast, Kurt, he is quick. Yes, and coming in from third base, his right-handers give on him. Melanger chokes on that bat about three or four inches. You can see the end of the bat handle hanging down there. Popped him up. Bobby Robertson at first wants it. And that'll stow the Orioles away. No run. One hit. No errors. And one left. And we go now to the bottom of the second inning and the score. Baltimore three and the Pirates two. Frank Osiak at third, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, Don Leppert at first base. This telecast is presented by the authority of Major League Baseball and is intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. 
Any publication, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, or accounts of this game without the express written consent of the Commissioner of Baseball is prohibited. That beep beep you hear in the background is for Manny Sanguin. He's known as the Roadrunner here. Batting at 319 on the season. Jammed on the pitch down to Brooks Robinson. Boog Powell and one out. Striding in now in your picture is Jackie Hernandez. Obtained from Kansas City in an offseason trade with pitcher Bob Johnson, in which the Pirates sent Freddie Patek. Jerry May and Bruce Dow Kenton there. Hernandez was not to have started tonight, but Gene Alley came up with an ailing knee. Strike. Baltimore leads 3-2, one out, none on in the bottom of the second inning. This broadcast coming to you. First night game in the history of the World Series and being seen all over the world here on NBC. In Taiwan, Canada, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, Colombia, Bermuda, Virgin Islands, Dominican Republic, Hawaii, Alaska, Mexico. And of course, our U.S. bases in Germany, Korea, Manila, Panama. One ball, one strike. Hernandez had ideas of bunting down to third base when he's going against the best in the game at charging the bunt and making that off balance throw to first in Brooks Robinson. On the corner, a ball and two strikes. And there you see the pirate bench, and that's uh, Billy Burden there, and I'm getting ready to bat, of course, Bruce Keeson. Two. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. Ball two, strike two. Pull slowly to third, foul. There's Brooks Robinson, than whom there is no homer. A tremendous third baseman for the Baltimore Oil. He was a little irritated tonight. They had uh, some write-ups in the Pittsburgh papers that Robinson wasn't going as well to his right as he did last year. A couple of shots were hit by him yesterday. He said those balls were by me. I didn't have a chance for them. I dived, but they were gone. Yes, they certainly were. Somebody apparently alluded to the fact he'd been on the banquet circuit a uh, little too much. Ball two, strike two. And there's a... Drive toward left center and right at Paul Blair. Fans tonight are watching probably the best defensive center fielder in baseball, Paul Blair. Hernandez becomes out number two, and now the relief pitcher, Bruce Keeson, to the plate. Keeson, after being called up from Charleston, made 31 uh, plate appearances with two base hits for the Pirates. He bats right-handed and hits a foul down the first base side, drifting towards the first base box seats and out of play. Strike one to the late swings of Keeson. Two gone in the Pirates' second inning. They trail by a run, three to two to Dobson in Baltimore. Dobson extending the arms, concentrating on the side. He delivers 0-1. Strike outside corner. He snapped at that corner again with a breaking ball. So he moves rapidly ahead of Keeson, 0-2. Keeson spreads the seat right to the front of the box. The 0-2 whipped in. Low, one ball and two strikes. Baltimore management uh, naturally feels since Dobson won 20 that they had a great off-season deal with San Diego when they picked up Dobson plus Duke. So one-two delivery. Low, two balls, two strikes to keep it. Two away. And the two-tour. Strike three, a fastball belt high poured right down the groove to the admiring Keeson. And Dobson, who had a shaky first inning, has a strong second inning. At the end of two innings of play, Baltimore three, Pittsburgh two. We were talking in uh, the last half inning how they 
key issue of that entire third World Series game was uh, brought up just by chance, and that was the fact that one of the writers asked Danny Murtaugh, I just happened to ask him, did you ever think about giving Robertson, uh, Robertson a bunt sign? And in that uh, tactical situation, it would have been the logical thing to do, and the Murtaugh just matter-of-factly said, well, as a matter of fact, I did give him the bunt sign. There was a shock pause from among the 50 or so media people in the room, and somebody said, you got to be serious about that. He said, yes, I am. He says, uh, that's it. We gave him the bunt sign. He simply missed it. Somebody said, well, are you going to find him? And then uh, Murtaugh thought about that one for a while, and I said, well, I don't think so under those conditions. Somebody says, well, how about giving him a bonus? Murtaugh said, possibly. So then somebody says, did you talk with him about it in the dugout afterward? Murtaugh says, yes, we talked about it a little bit. He said, what did you say to him? Well, I said, you fouled it up. And he said, I guess you're right, coach. I guess I did foul it up. Murtaugh answered all those questions, and Robertson waited off to the side to be asked questions, along with Steve Blass, who had limited the Orioles to three hits. So it was quite an interesting news conference following Game 3 of the World Series when it was discovered that a home run was hit on a missed bunt sign to give Pittsburgh a victory in Game 3 of the World Series. Let's pause right now for station identification. This is the American Forces Radio and Television Service. AFRTS in the Canal Zone. This is the Southern Command Radio Network, 790 and 1420 in your dial. Together with Jim Simpson, Bill O'Donnell back with you again here in Pittsburgh at Three River Stadium and in Baltimore's third. It'll be Merv Redmond, Frank Robinson, and Brooks Robinson against right-handed reliever Bruce Keeson. Keeson to Redmond. Strikes outside corner at the knee. Stargell in left is pulled over towards left against Rettenmund. Most of Rettenmund's power is up the middle and to power alleys. Changeup is inside. One ball and one strike. Keeson showed Rettenmund that big off-speed motion. And he went too tight to Rettenmund's knees. One ball and one strike. Rettenmund had an infield base hit to the hole at short in the first inning and scored a run. Baltimore leads 3-2. one winner. Way outside as Rettenmund began to check his swing on a breaking ball. Two balls and one strike. Rettenmund starting off the top of the third on two and one. He looks at strike two. It was bent to his knees to the outside edge of the plate. The count is two balls and two strikes. Rettenmund right now has four base hits in 14 World Series trips. The graduate of Ball State against Keeson, two and two, low and away. Full count now, three balls and two strikes. Rettmund ended the regular season strong, strong indeed with a nine-game hit streak. Also on the last road trip had a lot of base hits at Cleveland. Three and two. Here's a chopper over the mound. Mack at second base, the shortstop Hernandez comes his throw in time to Robertson, and Rettmund retired by a long stride. Now, Rettman has good speed down the first base side, so the combination of the chopper and deep behind the back, Hernandez had a hurry of throw to get Rettman by a step. One gun, top of the third. Baltimore leads Pittsburgh, three to two, and here's Frank Robinson. He was walked intentionally by starter Luke Walker in the three-run Baltimore first inning. Sidearm, fastball, cut out and miss. It was into the letters of the swinging Frank Robinson. The big day in Frank Robinson's 1971 season. A night in Baltimore, the 19th of September, when he hit his 500th home run. Swings and fouls it off straight back. 0-2. Oh that 500th home run, by the way, back in Baltimore, came as part of a doubleheader. Matter of fact, the first trip to the plate that Frank Robinson made in game one, he got number 499. Then in the ninth inning of game two, got that magic number 500. He's down to Keeson 0 2. The right hander winds, delivers, snaps it in the dirt outside. One ball and two strikes. Speaking of home runs, Frank Robinson was Baltimore's home run leader. 28 home runs, 99 runs batted in. He has eight World Series home runs, including two so far in this series. One away, bases empty, top of the third. The next pitch, a check swing foul, straight back. So he's staying the ball in two strikes between Keeson and Frank Robinson. Frank Robinson.
Mike Robinson's home run in this series have come at the expense of Steve Blass and Doc Ellis. As a matter of fact, as Blass gave up only three base hits uh, yesterday here, Frank Robinson had two of those three base hits. One and two. Next swing and strike three. Ball by Vargo, the plate umpire. Frank could not check his swing in time, broke the wrist, and strike three ripped up by the plate umpire. Keeson has his second strikeout in relief. It's coming on for starter Walker in the first inning. Three to two with two down in the top of the third. Here's Brooks Robinson sent out a long fly ball for a sacrifice in the first inning to drive in a run. Well, he started him off with a lazy change ball on. Much Sanguin behind the plate right now. Very low crouch presents an excellent target. Foul to what? Every manager wants his pitching staff to pitch low. They love a catcher who gets down like Sanguin and makes them pitch low and can handle low pitches. They look for this in a catcher. And the way he crouches there, you'd think that would foreshorten his hamstring muscles and make him a slow runner. He's anything but that, Kurt. He's the fastest running catcher in the game. One ball, one strike. Strike two. This kid looks good. Yes, he does. Looks like he'd uh, like to pitch well enough to miss the wedding if necessary Sunday next. He didn't want to hit that one, and Keeson feels his position. To Robertson, the inning is over. So it's three up and three down for the Baltimore Orioles, and we go to the bottom of the third, and they lead the Pirates by the score of three to two. Okay, I think my problem maybe when I look to Kurt is I'm turning away a little bit, Lou. I'll try to watch that. I'll try to watch it. But I love you. Later. <laughs> Roger, you in left field now? Here is part of the interior of this beautiful Three River Stadium going down the right field sign. It is 340 down both lines, 385 left center, right center, 410 straight away. There is an inner wall that is about 15 feet short of the back wall. And as you can see, this place is packed. Dave Cash, he walked in the first inning and scored a run. Ball. Notice how far in front of the plate when we get the shot of Dave Cash. He is right up on top of it. Ball two. There it is again. A good foot in front of the plate. World Series tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and a pregame report followed by the game at 12.45 right here from Pittsburgh on NBC. Ball free. A little difference of opinion there between Eddie Vargo and the batter Dave Cash. Ball. 
Bounce down to the shortstop, Belanger. Luke Powell and one away in the Pirate third. Baltimore three and the Pirates two. Here's Richie Hebner. He popped up to short in the first inning. You'll see that his right hand is right over the plate. You would think you could jam him. A base hit to right center. So Hebner gets the third hit off Dobson. And with Baltimore leading 3-2. The roar is for Roberto Clemente. Bob, you mentioned Clemente has hit safely in all 10 of his World Series games. Hank Bauer, the Yankees, holds the record for consecutive hitting streak in the World Series. Hank hit safely 17 World Series games in a row. Outfield around to the right on Clemente. The gap is still off the first base side now with Powell holding to Hebner. Long drive to right field, slicing, and it's a foul ball. And Clemente is going down to argue with the right field umpire, John Rice. And there goes the first base coach, Don Leppard. They thought that ball hit the foul pole for a home run. That's Leppard, the first base umpire, arguing with Rice. Clemente, when he crossed first base, ran down the line. And he's standing arms akimbo looking down. Just foul, said the right field umpire, John Rice. Clemente's been hitting those drives to deep right field all during the series. Watch this now. Here's our rerun. Drives it deep. The ball starts to slice. Man, I don't know. What do you think, Bob? Well, I don't know. I'd like to look at it again. But the way the ball bounced, it bounced to the left as though it hit the pole. The thing is, the ball hit something out there, and it's an unusual thing. Kurt, if the ball is slicing and is foul, you'd think it would go to the right. It bounced back in. You'd have to look at it again one more time, but that ball bounced. Look at it, and it comes back out in fair territory. That's a tough call. I'll tell you another thing, Kurt. Our bullpen is absolutely berserk out there. They couldn't believe it. There is that foul pole out there. It is not painted on the wall. That's a that's an iron pipe. There you see it. And look at our bullpen. And the ball then bounced. Back in fair territory rather than off to the right into the pirate bullpen. I don't think we can really call it on that rerun. I don't think so either, Kurt. It was close as fuzz on a tick's ear, though, I'll tell you that. The Pirates, of course, are going to lose the argument. And when this is all over, it's just a foul strike. Off the bat of Roberto Clemente. Pittsburgh's unhappy. They thought that was a two-run homer. There's Danny Murta. He nearly swallowed that shot backy on that one. And now a fan has jumped out of the stands. An irate fan is being escorted back in. He's mad. That's Hebner at first. And Clemente had gone to the bat on deck circle to get his bat. A crowd on his feet still unhappy at the right field umpire John Rice. He had a very difficult call to make on that drive down the right field line. In his defense too, Kurt, on a ball hit like that as far down the line as he is he has to turn very quickly and he doesn't get the chance to really get a good beat on it. Well it's still three to two Baltimore with Hebner at first base. No balls and one strike and we've had our first real serious rhubarb. And there's 
a base hit to right. And Hebner will go to second and hold. And here's Stodgill. And uh, Clemente continues to play brilliantly in every department in this series. Here's Earl Weaver. Here's Clemente again. He just come up with his sixth hit of the series. Look at him cock that leg. Reaching it outside pitch and stroking it to right field. Five of his six hits have been to right field. Three of them have been hit with power to right, and he just missed a home run and a foul ball. Baltimore begins to warm left-hander Grant Jackson in his left field goaltend, along with a right-hander Dave Leonard. Everybody tries to pitch Clemente outside, and whether they do or not, Clemente, whether he's pitched outside or inside, does have opposite field power. As a matter of fact, as some years ago, it was the opinion of the most every baseball man that Clemente had the greatest opposite field power of anybody in baseball. So Pirate fans actually going wild, first on a controversial foul call on the right field umpire right, on the long hammering drive by Clemente, and now juiced up again on Clemente's base hit to right. And there's a second. Clemente's at first, and the batter is Willie Sargent. He doubled over Cash with a pirate run on the first inning. Two on, one out. Breaking ball is blowing away to Sargent. Dobson, who had a shaky first, again throwing on thin ice here in the bottom of the third. Sargent, one and oh, takes the strike to himself. One ball and one strike. Sargio just had a fabulous start in 1971. He had 11 home runs in the month of April and finished off with 48 to lead the nation. He's battling Dobson, one and one with two runners on at second and third. Outside, loaded start. Two balls and one strike. Baltimore got rid of starter Luke Walker early in the very first inning. Pirates trying to get rid of Baltimore's Dobson here in the third. The two and one. Swing and a miss. And Sargio, I mean, he let it all go. He was right field power conscious against that breaking ball into his hands by Dobson. Two balls and two strikes. Baltimore bullpen still active. Right-hander Leonard and left-hander Jackson. Hefner at second. Clemente at first. One away. On a two-ball, two-strike situation to Sargio. Fouled right back, ripped off the middle of Sargent's back. It is pretty difficult to believe that back in 1959, when Sargent broke into organized ball, he was only 5 feet 10 and 152 pounds, and look at him now, 225 pounds of power in Sargent against the setting Dobson. His 2-2 issue, swing and a foul on the ground, back of the plate. Sargil right now, he's looking for a pitch in his happy zone, and Dobson trying to keep it away from Sargil's long ball power. Sargil squeezing that bat and holds it right down on top of the knob. That's your darn wigwag signals out to the gaze of the set to Dobson. The two runners are checked. Two to her. Popped up into shallow center. Back is Belanger from short. On comes Blair. It's Blair's call. And it's Blair's foot out in shallow center field. Out number two in the Pirates' third inning. Hefner still at second. He had the one-out single. Clemente, who followed him with a base hit to right, is still at first base. And here is Al Oliver. Oliver looped a popping two-bagger into shallow center in the second inning. When it bounced, it then bounced over Blair's head for a two-bagger to score Stargell and make it three to two. It is still three to two here in a controversial third inning. Oliver, a left-hand swinger off the plate. Line drive, right field, base hit. Hefner rounding third, coming home. Frank Robinson throw is cut off and the run scores. The three three. The throw home from right field by Frank Robinson cut off between third base and home plate by Blue Powell. Oliver's on a two for two night. Now driven over two in Pittsburgh, three runs, and 
Titans' fourth World Series game starts all over. Baltimore 3 and Pittsburgh 3. On the RBI, single to right by Oliver. Hefner is scored from second day. Clemente goes from corner to corner. He's now at third with two out. Plus Oliver at the other corner at first base to be held by Powell. Off Dobson misses. Three runs, five hits overall by Pittsburgh. And here is the right hand cutting Bob Robertson. He went out on the ground ball to the mound. The Dobson in the first inning. The corner runners leave. Swing of the foul. It comes ripping off the middle of Echeverin's mass. Back of the plate. And strike one to Bob Robertson. The young pirate sensation out of the state of Maryland facing the Baltimore Ball Club from the state of Maryland here in the bottom of the third with Oliver at third and Clemente at third and two out and a 3-3 three, three deadline. Dobson watching Edgar Barron checks the runners off the corner. His one strike pitch is a check swing ground ball towards the first base foul line. Fielded by Dobson, he throws out the check swinging Robertson for the final out. But give the Pirates a tying run with three base hits. They leave men stranded at the corner. At the end of three innings of play, it's now Baltimore three and Pittsburgh three. Marlon Bill O'Donnell, Jim Simpson back at Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh. Bruce Keeson, the young 21-year-old of Pasco, Washington, warms up with Manny Sanguian. Uh, the Orioles who broke to a 3-0 lead in the first inning. Had that lead shipped away for two by the Pirates at the bottom of the first. And Al Oliver is just single in the tying run at 3-3 as we go to the top of the fourth inning. It'll be Boo Powell. Davey Johnson and Andy Etcheberry. And since Keeson has come on, he has given up a double, a looping ball that bounced over the head of Oliver in center field. Other than that, he has retired the other seven men that he has faced. And here he is now, right-hander Keeson, left-hander Boo Powell, and Bill O'Donnell. In the top of the fourth inning, Powell starts it off his sacrifice fly, has scored an Oriole run in that three-run first inning. The Orioles have not scored since. They're in a 3-3 lockup. Changeup to the flag poured in by the youngster, Keeson. Well, you have to think that Keeson, when he did come on in the first inning to relieve Walker, he must have had some, he had those funny butterflies moving around in that stomach, but I'm sure now he's a little bit more confident. So one strike deal, off speed again outside. One ball and one strike to Powell. If there has been any steady diet of pattern workmanship to Powell, it has been off-speed pitches by the Pirate Pitching Corps. Jesus, 1-1 one, one deal. Fastball is low. Two balls and a strike. Foul, one hit in 12 at-bats. In this fourth game of the World Series, did knock over his first run. His sacrifice fly for out number two in the first inning scored Retma. Jason, 2 one Powell. Fastball, strike. He just challenged Powell, belt high. Powell looks at him. Two balls, two strikes as we start the top of the fourth. Well, normally you talk about nail-biting time late in a ball game. I guess in a World Series it's nail-biting time anytime, Especially right now in a 3-3 tie. Two-tour. High pump up. Along the first base foul line of the foul territory is Robertson, the first backer. And he loves it. Powell fouls out to Bob Robertson. in relief, retired the first three men he faced. Johnson for the third out in the first inning. Then Etchebarren and Dobson for the first two killings in the second, before the two-bagger by Blair. Since Blair is two-bagger, in order, he has set down Belanger, Rettenlund, Frank Robinson, Brooks Robinson, and now Powell to begin the top of the fourth. Dave Johnson, try to call this knee. Johnson, an extra base power, right-hand swinger. Grounded out third to first in the first inning. Inside for a ball, one ball and one strike to Johnson. In 1969, Johnson batted 280. Last year, 281. This year, 282. So that's consistency personified. He's hit in the back, letter high. He tried to twist out against Keeson inside pitch. Turned on the pitch and was hit in the back right about letter high around his number 15. So Johnson is a one-out base runner. Hit by Keeson with one gun in the top of the fourth, and here's Andy Etcheverry. Minor 
League days or Major League days, Echeverin just finished off his finest season with an average of 270. Stroke nine homers, drove over 29 runs. Sangean sets the outside target. Here's a ground ball to the shortstop. Hernandez to second. One out to Kay.
across the letters and down the arm of third base coach Frank Osiak. On the other side, the Pirate Lieutenant Don Leppard watching the lead closely of Jackie Hernandez. As will Dobson from the mound plus first baseman Powell. Hernandez sets off his lead. Two to her. Fouled off to the right. Dobson and Keeson keep riding at a count of two balls and two strikes. The Pirates greeted Dobson with two runs and two hits in the first inning after Baltimore baptized and knocked out Walker with three runs and three hits in the first inning. The Buckos have since tied it up. Outside and low, three balls and two strikes. Keeson was down two strikes to Dobson. And Dobson may be trying to be a little bit too fine with pinpoint control. His three balls and two strikes against Keeson. Hernandez with as much of a lead as he can get. Will he run? He stays. It's low, ball four. Keeson walks. Hernandez advances to second. Two pirate runners with one out in the bottom of the fourth inning and the leadoff. Second baseman, Dave Chan. Dobson has just given up his second walk, and for the second time in this ball game, Earl Weaver is marching to the mound. If he wants to go to his bullpen, he's had Jackson warming for quite a spell. He's also had Leonard warming for quite a spell. At the moment, Weaver has not made an indication. He has marched hurriedly between catcher Echeverria and pitcher Dobson. Weaver with his hands right on his hips, jawing with Andy Echeverin and also jawing and conversing with Pat Dobson and slapping his hands. And I'm assuming what Weaver is trying to do is convince Dobson that he must concentrate and must throw strikes. Weaver has made his decision for the moment. He is staying with Dobson. If he makes another visit here in the fourth inning, he must go to his bullpen, where left-hander Jackson and right-hander Leonard still throw easily. Cash has walked and scored and has bounced to short. Hernandez is second. And Walker, who just walked at first base. And one gone on the Pirate board. Cash strokes the foul. Back of the plate, strike one. Talk about uh, youngsters who, you know, enjoy baseball and perhaps, as teenagers say, look forward someday to becoming professional ball players. I'm sure you have to put cash in that category because when he was a youngster many years ago and a teenager in Utica, he and his mother used to take long bus rides to Ebbets Field to watch the Dodgers play. One striker to cash. Here's a ground ball slowly out towards third, and it goes foul halfway down the line. Cash took a big cut and was out in front of a Dobson pitch. So, Dobson, who is two strikes on top of Keeson, is now the same way to lead off man Cash at 0 2. The Pirate base runners, Hernandez at second, and pitcher Keeson at first. Baltimore got three in the top of the first inning and hammered out Walker. Then Keeson shut the door. Baltimore had its lead cut apart by the Pirates, who scored two in the bottom of the first, and then the Pittsburgh ball club tied it in the bottom of the third. They're threatening again here in the fourth. Two on, one out. The two-strike pitch whipped in. Curve is a little bit outside as Cash just checked his swing and time. Cash had that finger on the bat. He had the finger on the trigger and then just loosened it up off the trigger. One ball and two strikes to Dave Cash. Cash shows two hits in 14 at-bats in this World Series. Keith and the runner at first base, not held by Powell. He's got the windbreaker on to keep the right arm warm. Off second base, Hernandez, with only one away. Stops to the cash, one and two. Breaking ball, slap towards short. Belanger shovels the second, one out. The throw to first in time. And Keithson, who tried to take out Johnson with a shoulder-high move, rolled over. And here's Johnson pointing right at Keithson. So the Orioles get a twin killing, Belanger to Johnson to Powell. They got Keeson at second, who barreled in, chest and shoulder high to Johnson, just as he got rid of his double play throw to Powell at first base at the end of four inning. Baltimore three, and Pittsburgh three. We hit the top of the fifth inning, Keeson ready to throw to Pat Dobson, and here's Bill up. 
All right, Jim Keeson and Dobson so far have looked at each other once. Dobson looked at strike three from the right-hander Keeson in the second inning. Dobson, Blair, Belanger, game four of the 1971 World Series. Top of the fifth inning at a 3-3 tie. Strike is a Dobson knee. Keeson with the arms draped down by the side, and the slender right-hander has his signs from Sam Gian. Sidearm breaking ball, packed in beautifully for strike two calls. Dobson is down, two strikes to Keeson. Baltimore, three runs, four hits. Pittsburgh, three runs, and six hits. Okay, on two. Swing a foul right off the end of Dobson's bat. Eugene Keeson, born in Pasco, Washington, and still resides in the Pacific Northwest. Dobson laying that bat behind the right shoulder. Checks his swing and fouls it off to the right of home plate. So it's still a holding count of 0-2. The Pirate outfield, Stargell and left, Oliver in center, and Clemente in right are playing Dobson straight away. The shortstop, Hernandez, shades his glove side. Way outside, a ball and two strikes to Dobson. Keeson, in relief of left-handed starter Luke Walker, has hit a batter, fan two, and given up a base hit. He won two Dobson, strikes him out swinging. They'll give the 21-year-old Keeson his third strikeout in relief. He saws off Dobson, and now he'll face Blair, who's had a perfect night and a perfect World Series. Blair with a base hit in the first inning left center, scored a run as he romped home in a pass ball by San Gian. He doubled with two away in the second inning. Blair has gone to left center and to right center with his two hits tonight. Batting with one gun. He twists around, loses his balance on a high tight pitch. One ball and no strikes. The Probables in game five tomorrow afternoon. Nelson Browse for Pittsburgh, Dave McNally for Baltimore. Strike outside corner to Blair. One ball and one strike. When Blair batted in the second inning, we told you about his only base hit in the 66 World Series, a home run to win game three. He also did a great job with a glove. It's in the dirt and outside. Two balls and one strike. And I would have guessed that the Dodger of 66, who most remembers Paul Blair, would be Jim LeFever as Blair just played robber against a left center field fence drive by Lefevre to preserve, turned out to be a one nothing Baltimore victory. He's two balls and one strike against Keeson. Keeson has been on the scene in relief since the first inning. Two and one now. His stroke fell off to the right. Keeson, as we told you, is a side-arming right-hander. Likes to challenge hitters as he just challenged Blair right there. Tip to her. Inside, and Blair has to brace himself on one hand to keep from completely falling down. Keeson became a side-armer because as a teenager, he was hit on the elbow and the arm, causing considerable pain. Found out throwing sidearm, he didn't have any pain. Three and two. Hit out to center field, the fly ball being chased by Oliver. He's on the warning track and one hand. Two steps back on the warning track in center field. Blair is out number two in the top of the fifth inning in a 3-3 Oriole Pirate fourth game tie. Baltimore leads in this World Series, two victories to one. They won the first two games at Baltimore's Memorial Stadium, 5-3 and 11-3. Pittsburgh won its first game yesterday, 5-1, behind Steve Blake. The batter is Mark Belanger. He has an infield base hit, and he's also popped up. Strike is letter high. Right at the bag, a step inside the line is third baseman Hebner against Belanger's speed. Low and outside, he just missed the corner. And San Gian, a little annoyed at plate umpire of Argo. Old San Gian thought he had the strike call. One ball and one strike. Belanger played as an opposite field swinger by the pirate outfield. One-one-er. 
Check swing. It was low, and here's Sam Gian asking Vargo to double check with Jim Odom. And Odom agrees with Vargo's check swing call back at home plate. Two balls and one strike to Belanger. He's at the plate with two gone in the top of the fifth inning. The winding Keeson two and one. And Belanger has to sit down. That was right into Belanger's ear. He twisted away and sat down right in his chest. Three balls and one strike. Keeson has hit a batter. He ripped Dave Johnson on the back in the fourth inning. And he almost got Belanger in the ear here in the top of the fifth. He's fallen behind on a three ball, one strike count. Kepner tighter at third against Belanger. Then is Robertson at the other corner. Three and one now. Strike right down the middle. Three balls and two strikes to Mark Belanger. Belanger three for 12 in this World Series. He proved his batting average over last season by some 40 points. It's a fly ball right center field way. Oliver from center calls off Clemente. There's Oliver. He's got it measured, and there's the third out. At the end of four and a half innings. Baltimore three, Pittsburgh three. A three-three tie in the bottom of the fifth inning, and here with pleasure is Jim Simpson. Pat Dobson hanging in there. He has been on the ropes in three of the four innings he has pitched. Pitching out of Hefner, outside of the high, ball one. Hefner popped out in the first, single, moved the second on Clemente, single in the third, and scored the tying run on Oliver's single. Strike one, one and one to Hefner. Three runs, four hits, no errors for the Orioles. Three runs, six hits, no errors for the Pirates. Keeson has blanked the Orioles. He's coming on in the last of the first. Back with a breaking pitch up high. It is two balls, one strike to Hefner. Dobson has walked two, struck out two. Hefner left-handed swinger. Now two for five in serious play. Dobson back with a breaking pitch. It misses inside, and Hefner started to throw the ball, or rather the bat away, figuring it was ball four, but it's three balls, one strike. On deck is Roberto Clemente. Baltimore bullpen with a count of three and one is up and throwing again. Brad Jackson has been up and throwing. Left-handed. That is up and throwing again. Back with a breaking pitch. It's fouled down the right field line. Jackson at the moment, the only one throwing in the Baltimore bullpen. Three balls, two strikes to Hefner. Now he is joined by Dave Leonard. Danny Murtaugh has gone to his bullpen but once, and that's the good-looking Bruce Keeson. He's done a commendable job since coming on in the last of the first. Three and two to Hefner, who waits. Stops and throws, breaking pitch, ball strike three, catches the outside corner and catches Hefner on his way to first with what he thought was the base on ball. But Dobson throws the breaking pitch and strikes him out. Here is Clemente that went down swinging at a breaking pitch in the first inning and then involved the Pirates and umpire John Rice down the right field line of the biggest dispute of this 1971 World Series. A ball that was barely fouled. Our instant replay monitor from television showed us John Rice called it foul. But the Pirates, and particularly first base coach Don Leppard, argued long that it was a fair ball. But then he hit the next pitch he saw after that dispute for a base hit, moving Hebner down to second from whence he scored the tying run. One out of the fifth, Dobson ready to throw to Clemente. Overhand pitch that stays down low to Clemente. Below the knees, it's ball one. Frank Clemente, as they always do, at least they always have in this series, Baltimore, to hit to right. has that body out over the plate, although his legs are moving around quite a bit. Looks like he's bailing out. Dobson ready to throw another off-speed pitch, and it's fouled back past the screen. One ball, one strike. The fifth game of this World Series, tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock. Our air time, 12.45 Eastern Time. Baltimore leads two games to one. This game is tied three apiece. One ball, one strike. Breaking pitch right past Dobson in the center field base hit. Base hit number seven. Clemente takes a big turn at first base. Blair rifles the ball in to Davey Johnson. And that Baltimore bullpen begins to work again.
again as Willie Stargell steps up. Stargell in a breaking pitch and doubled. The deep right driving in. Dave Cash with the first Pittsburgh run back in the first and then battled option only to fly to short center field in the third. Everybody looking for the Major League home run champion to uncork one, and with plenty of first and one out, starts to the left hander steps in against the right hander. Thompson, who keeps it low and away, is out of the strike zone, ball one. In the National League Championship Series, National League pitchers from the Giants had great success with Stargell with the fastball in tight around the letters. In this particular game, Dobson has been working mostly away, and there's a breaking pitch that catches the outside corner. Dobson has been working on the outside of the plate for Stargell and has been hurt on one occasion with a run scoring double. Stargell later scored the second run himself. One ball, one strike. They play Stargell, of course, a full hitter way around the right. Now holding the runner, Clemente at first base. Back with the fastball, it's too high, and it's two balls, one strike to Stargell. They will remember this first night game in series history a long time. First four and a half innings have just been dead. And the crowd has reacted to almost every pitch. Two and one, Stargell waits. Hits one off the fifth, up the middle, base hit, on his way around second base, player in, on his way to third, here goes the throw to third base. Robinson backs up and down the second on the throw. Goes Stargell. The Pirates have runners at second and third with one out. And Al Oliver was still for two, the hitter. One out, first base is open. Oliver is a left-handed swinger. On deck is the right-handed swinger, Bob Robertson. Andy Echeverra now dropped off, talked about Thompson. Dave Leonard throwing in the Baltimore bullpen. Jackson is not now throwing. That's the eighth hit for the Pirates. Three runs, eight hits, no errors. The Orioles have three runs, four hits, and no errors. And Oliver steps in. Last time, he was first ball hitting and ripped the single to right. And they're going to put him on. the possibility of the double play, of course, or the plate of the plate, at least. And Bob Robertson, who twice has been badly fooled by Dobson pitches, the last time checking his swing, but both times for the first and third innings, rounding right back to Dobson at the mound. That's ball three to Oliver. Lamenti over at third base. He is two for three tonight. Stargell is also two for three. He is down at second base, and now Oliver drops down the first after the intense to walk, and here comes Bob Robertson. Hit. That was when he missed the bunt sign in the seventh inning yesterday and swung away at Homer to the opposite field, driving in three runs. The Baltimore, Maryland Orioles, Scott Dobson facing the now savage Maryland, Pittsburgh slugger Bob Robertson. Bases are loaded with one out. Clemente coming down the line at third. All runners with short leads. Breaking pitch, it's too high, and it's ball one to Robertson. One of those cases where Dobson must be careful, but he can't be too cute. A walk drives in a run. He has got the challenge, Bob Robertson. One and oh pitch. Comes back with a fastball and is popped up to the infield. Langer back, Clemente's down the line, and will now run back to third base. And so thus far, the Orioles' strategy has worked, and here comes Fanny Sanguian. Sanguian bounced to Robinson at third base, singled and stole second in the fourth, and then was guilty of some base running, caught off second base when Hernandez dumped the ball back to Dobson. They say in baseball, if you're going to have a rundown, only one throw is necessary. That's all it took to get Sam Gian. Dobson ran it back, then flipped to the Lancer, who put the tag on. Base is still loaded, two out of this 3-3 ball game. We are the last of the pit, and Sam Gian 
A 300 hitter during the regular season stands in. Right hander with a slight crouch. He swings at everything. Swings this time. Ground ball for Langer. Langer will go to a jump to the second base with a force play. And it works perfectly as nailed at second base is Al Oliver. And the Orioles are out of another inning, and so is Pat Dobson. A runs, two hits. No errors, and three men left. We've gone five full innings. The Orioles three. The Pirates three. He's in ready to throw to Redmond, who is one for two. Sidearm inside with the breaking pitch. It's ball one. Redmond beat out an infield hit. Hernandez did well to keep it in the infield, going far back on the grass in the first inning, and Merv later scored. And then Hernandez threw out uh, Redmond in the third with a chop behind second base. Here's a line drive to Hernandez. He takes it off his ankles, and he has been involved in all three times at bat. A first Redmond, one out in the Baltimore six. And here's Frank Robinson. Robinson has hit at every game until this one. Walked intentionally in the first. And could not check his swing in the third and went down swinging. Before Keeson. Keeson, the side-arming right-hander, has hit one batter. That was Davy Johnson. Has come close to hitting others. And sends a breaking pitch too low. To Frank Robinson, ball one. In 130 innings in the Eastern League a year ago, Keeson, with that side-arm motion of his, hit 21 batters. Fastball fouled off down toward the third base coaching box. One ball, one strike. One ball, one strike. Keys and the ball got away from him. Strides off the mound. Tall youngster, 21 years old. One and one. Robinson stands in close to the plate and talk about hitting batters. Only Ron Hunt now with Montreal has been hit more times than Frank Robinson who fouls this pitch off to the left again and skips up in the seat behind the Oriole dugout. One ball, two strikes to Robinson. Orioles got all three of the runs in the first inning. Keeson came on and got the last man and since that time has given up just one base hit, hit a batter, and struck out three and walked nobody. Pat Dobson, as Bill told you, has been battling all the way. Only had one easy inning. That was in the second with the lower end of the batting order. Robinson ready again after the foul. One and two, and Keeson ready to throw. Throws inside and hits Robinson, and that is the second man. And this time, there was no chance for Robbie to get out of the way at all. He was hit in the knee as he twisted away from the ball, and Ralph Savon comes out the trainer to take a look at his team. Robinson standing at the uh, home plate there. Just no chance at all to get away out of the way of that pitch. That is the tenth time this year that Frank has been hit nine times during the regular season. And Belanger, who had to get out of the way of a head-high fastball in the last inning, has been hit seven times. Robinson all right and is walking it off now, heading down for first base. We said Keeson with all that six feet four inches of him and the sidearm motion comes off the mound almost from the third base side into a right-handed batter. It's just very difficult to get out of the way, but that pitch was simply way inside. Here is Brooks Robinson. Sacrifice fly, drove in Belanger with the second Oriole run back in the first. Checked his swing and grounded right back to Keeson in the third. Now there's strike one. Robinson, believe it or not, Never been hit with a baseball. Well, Frank now has been hit 179 times in his major league career. Now the check over to first as Frank was about four or five steps off the bat. Three to three the score. We're in the top of the sixth. Fourth World Series game and the first ever at night. Keeson knocks to Sanguini as a sign and the fastball stays high. Although Sanguini and some of the part fans did not think so. And now for the first time since Keeson began to warm in the first inning, it's the pirate bullpen that begins to get busy. One ball, one strike. It's like Bob Miller from here, the right-hander who has been around the National and American League before. Down ball foul at the plate. Dave Mazzone, the bat boy of Baltimore, who retires after this year, picks it up and flips it away. One ball, two strikes. Now, Dave McDowley, as Bill O'Donnell pointed out, pitched the opener last Saturday, one at five to three. Nellie Bryles scheduled a to pitch tomorrow, keeping in mind the problems of Dobson and the departed Luke Walker, has not pitched since September the 30th 
and pitched only three innings then. He's in ready, one, two, low and away, and it's 2-2 now to Brooks Robinson. Robinson, as all Oriole followers know, and so does the American League, a very dangerous, perhaps the most dangerous late inning hitter on the Orioles ball club. Two-two pitch, long drive, center field. Oliver goes back near the warning track, waves. He's got it and takes it with a stride on the warning track. And back to first base goes Frank Roberts. And that'll bring up Boo Powell. Powell is one for 13 officially at a sacrifice fly. Back in the first inning, it drove in Bretman with the third Baltimore run in that three-run first against Luke Walker. In the fourth inning, Keeson did a magnificent job on Boo Powell. He busted a fastball in on him at the waist and then caught him looking at a breaking pitch that he swung a little late on and popped it up foul and it was caught and Powell was retired. Three to three to score, two out. Robinson hit by a pitch, still on at first base. Keeson working left handed Powell, pulls the ball right to Bob Robinson at first base. Well hit ball, he steps on the back and that's it. Come on, no hit, no air. Frank Robinson left on at first. Go to the last of the six. It's a thriller. Orioles three. Pirates three. You tie in the bottom of the sixth inning. Three runs, four hits for Baltimore. Three runs, eight hits for Pittsburgh. And in the bottom of the sixth inning, back we go to Jim Simpson. All right, Bill, Jackie Hernandez. Blair made a fine running catch of his line drive at the second, and he bounced the ball back to Dobson, and Sandin was trapped off second base in the fourth. 0 for 2. In this 3-3 ball game, Dobson to throw to the right-handed Hernandez, who tries to bunt his way on, but it is foul. And as we began the last of the six, that was the 97th pitch thrown by Pat Dobson, who has not worked since September the 24th. It might be win, lose, or draw, or the remainder of the game, if it is a tie, that Dobson may have to go, simply because he's thrown a lot of pitches. He's up to 97 already. Hernandez back in the box after trying to bunt his way on. Dobson ready. Breaking pitch inside, and Hernandez hits the dirt, but it was a change, and there was no danger of his being hit. And again, win, lose, or draw. You can mark one thing down for Pat Dobson. He is quite a competitor, only not in trouble in the second inning. One ball, one strike. Back with a fastball, line drive, Belanger, pass to slow. Hernandez has a base hit. And that is base hit number nine. comes Bruce Keeson, who will get quite a hand, and I would imagine that both Brooks Robinson and Boo Powell will be breaking toward the plate. In a 3-3 ball game, in the later inning, the leadoff man on, and the base hit, and the pitcher up. They are looking bunt. Leonard begins to warm in the Baltimore bullpen. They're breaking in. He misses the bunt. Now it is fouled as he caught it off the end of his bat and stays right there at the plate. Check one. One of the pretty plays in all of baseball to see as Hernandez took off for second. Ruth Powell charging from first. Robertson charging from third. Davey Johnson on his way to first. The cover there. Belanger moving toward second. Everybody moving. One strike to Keeson. They're beginning to break in again. There's the punter, and that's foul again at the plate. And now Keeson will take a look down to Osiak. A ninth hit. That's the most that uh, the Pirates have had in the World Series, and this is the fourth game. Might be that they're still having Keeson running. We'll see. Called out on a fastball in the second inning and had an 0-2 count on him in the fourth and drew a walk. Jackson is now throwing in the Baltimore bullpen. He is trying to bunt, but instead looks at a third call strike. the fourth, and of course, Keaton fails to move the runner down. Etchebaron runs out to talk to Dobson as pitcher as Dave Cash steps in. Cash walked in the first and scored ahead of Stargell's double. Has great speed. In a 3-2 pitch, and grounded the Belanger in the third and grounded into a fast double play in the fourth. Cash, a fine competitor, fine speed, and a good hitter. At 289 during the regular season. 
Hernandez, lead off first base. He is on his way to second base. Swing and a miss. Edge of Aaron throw down to second base. Into the stolen base. And that's the second. They have stolen off Thompson tonight. Now Keeson could move him down, so Danny Murtaugh decided to send him down. And Hernandez steals second base. Cash swinging to protect the runner. And Pat Thompson will be forgiven without holding Hernandez too close because Dobson was probably told in the clubhouse meetings of scouting reports of the Orioles on the Pirates that Jackie Hernandez has not stolen on a base all year. That is number one. Like one to count catch. Hernandez with a good lever off at second base. Dobson looks back and throws. It's down low. One ball, one strike. Three runs, four hits, no errors for the Orioles. Three runs, nine hits, and no errors for the Pirates. And we're the last of the six. Thompson throws foul wide into the seats. Down the right field side. And the fans are on. One of the ushers down there who grabbed the ball as it came back on the field, turned around and looked at the spectator, but did not toss in the ball. Said something and kept the ball in the ballpark. Dobson with a little room to work here. One ball, two strikes to catch. Hernandez off at second with one out. Dobson throws way out, and Echeverin does a great job to keep that from being a wild pitch. Had to dive to his right and backhand the ball as he fell down. Got up quickly, but Hernandez was not on his way. Two balls, two strikes. Jackson and Leonard continue to throw on the Baltimore bullpen. This crowd of well over 50,000 warming to this fourth game of the World Series. The first at night, they've got a dandy. It is 3-3. Three 2-2 two -two pitch, it is inside, and Cash backs away, and he's going all the way on him. Three balls, two strikes. That's your bad runs out for a conference. By the way, I and a lot of other folks came into Three River State in the night armed with raincoats, armed with top coats, and along the dugouts down the first and third base line, you can see top coats just tossed on top of the dugout. It's a rather comfortable night. As we came on the air, the temperature was 72 degrees. Three and two, Hernandez off at second base. Thompson ready to throw to Cash and throws. The ball hit right back off Thompson's club. It charges. Thompson cannot make the play. They hit. Hernandez goes to third. And that'll bring up Hefner. Thompson did not show the quickest reactions after stopping that ball. It rolled on the... Well, it was much closer to the mound than it was to Johnson playing deep at second. Johnson ran in. By the time he picked it up, Hernandez was the third. He could stop him from scoring. But Cash, who has a lot of speed, was well across first base. Consultation on the mound, and Dobson is out of there. And with the left-hander Hefner coming up, I would imagine it's going to be the left-hander Grant Jackson coming on to pitch to it. Hefner is one for three tonight in this three-to-three ball game. The go-ahead run is at third base with just one out. And as Jackson comes in, he is going to move in the quite a part of that Pittsburgh batting order. Hefner, Flametti, and perhaps Stargell, Oliver Robertson. What an awesome group that the Pirates have, and tonight they've banged out ten hits as compared to four for the Orioles. The score at the moment is even Steven at 3-3, and here comes Grant Jackson, Bill. Well, Jim, if Jackson comes on and uh, the Baltimore starter, Pat Dobson, departs, the Pirates, with only one inning, failed to have at least one base hit. They have already delivered two base hits off Dobson here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Now, we take you to Tony Kubek. With a left-hander due up for the Pirates, Richie Hebner, Earl Weaver brings in Grant Jackson, a left-hander. We'll see if the Pirates now will switch to a right-handed pinch hitter. While Jackson warms up, let's go down to Tony. With me down here near the commissioner's box, Stan the Man Usual. And Stan, you played on some pretty good hitting ball clubs in your day, but this Pirate team's a pretty good hitting team, too, isn't it? Uh, yes, they do. They have a lot of line draft hitters and a lot of power hitters, uh, Tony, so they're a very good hitting club. Do you think uh, any of the teams that you played on were better than this? 
Uh, no, they had a good all-around hitting club, but uh, I would say they missed a lot of opportunities here because they had a lot of chance to hit with men on here. Well, you know, they've had a, a man in scoring position in every inning so far in this ball game, and of course they've only got three runs. Looks like they should have had more. I, I agree with you, Tony, because uh, it's lot, lot, sometimes you miss these opportunities while they pass you by. Young Bruce Keeson, the right-hander of the sidearm, looks pretty tough, too, doesn't he? Oh, yes, he's surprising when he keeps that ball down, down low, and he has a good sinker ball, so he's a tough little pitcher. Yeah, you know, we've talked about the Pirate Club stand, but this ball memorial club does so many things so well. They're one of the best all-around ball teams I've seen in a long time. Uh, no question about that, Johnny. They're sound with their pitching, hitting, and defense, and uh, they have a very fine ball club. One more quick question. Oh, about your golf game? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been fighting you right. You got her on shooting straps? Oh, no. <laughs> Hi, Danny. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Let's go upstairs. A good life. Baltimore's reliever, the left-hander, Grant Jackson, has come on to replace Pat Dobson. We're five in the third inning. Has given up three runs and ten base hits. Jackson, a left-hander, an ex-national leaguer, with the Phillies a year ago, primarily a fastball thrower. Jackson to throw to Hefner, and there's a ground ball. Brooks Robinson has it. It happened so fast. Robinson dove to his right and caught the ball and looked to third base and was going to crawl to third base. But Hernandez got back very quickly. And there are two out. And there's another incredible play by Brooks Robinson. One pitch, a well-hit ball, and Jackson was retired one man. You know, it's a funny thing. As Earl Weaver trots out now to tell Jackson what he wants done with Clemente, and maybe that's all for Jackson, I don't know, with Leonard the right-hander throwing. Now in from second base comes Belanger. They may be setting up what to do, depending on what it is that Clemente does. But it's a funny thing. In Pittsburgh papers, after yesterday's victory, they were saying Brooks Robinson no longer was the human vacuum cleaner. There had been two doubles ripped down the third base line, and he didn't have the reflexes to make the catch. Well, I want to tell you, that was quite a reflex diving toward third base that Brooks Robinson had there, and he came up with the ball, and it's two out now instead of one. The runners at the top. Jim, I got to guess that uh, one thing that Earl Weaver said to uh, Grant Jackson, a left-hander, facing the right-hand swings of the Clemente, is that a left-hand batter, Stargell, is coming up next. And uh, I would assume he didn't want to go with the right-hander, Leonard, against uh, Clemente, and then follow with the left-hander, Stargell. So he probably has warned Jackson, don't give Clemente anything good, work on him carefully, and then go after Stargell next. Clemente is two for three. 11 World Series games Roberto has been in, and he's hit safely in all of them. And how? Jackson Reddy throws outside and low. Etchbarren simply moved off the plate. And if you've been listening to these World Series games, you know that they work Clemente outside and preferably low. Luke Powell is now called on by catcher Etchbarren not to hold the runner, Cash, despite his feet at first base. They're interested in Mr. Clemente, especially since he hits the right and Powell backs up at first. One ball, no strike. Three to three to score. We are in the last of the six. Jackson throws. Fastball. Strike. Well, he checked his swing, but it's a strike. One ball, one strike. Well, then he struck out of the curve in the first. Had that disputed ball down the right field line that was called a foul and followed with a run scoring single in the third. Single in the fifth. Checked that his single in the third did not score a run, but moved the man over who did score, which had to He got it in this ball game. Jackson taking a lot of time and working. Now Etchebarren moves inside, and the pitch is inside and low, and Clemente fouls it off to the right. Andy Etchebarren simply does not lean one way or the other. He simply positions himself outside or inside. One ball, two strikes. But again, Clemente is a great two-strike hitter. Jackson, the left-hander. Hernandez down the line, pitches inside, breaking pitch, it's two balls, two strikes. Clemente keeps checking with Osiak at third base, and so does Hernandez, the third base runner. Echeverin moves outside this time, the pitch is outside, and low, and it is three and two. Well, as Bill suggested, Jackson is working Clemente very carefully. He has kept the ball low. He has gone outside and inside. Primarily, his pitches have been to the outside of the plate. Clemente stepped out, now steps in. 
Jackson has pitched against him many times before. Echeverin is outside. The ball is hit outside. Foul and deep down the right field line. Already had enough oomph with that swing of the bat to get it out of here had it stayed there. The swing late at the outside pitch drilled it foul down the right field side. So again, it is three balls, two strikes. Cash will be moving off at first. Hernandez will be checking to see what happens at third. There goes Cash. Pitches low. Ball for him. He walks to load it up. And Wilbur Darnell Scarjo was in a double to drive in a run, quarter on himself, fly to center field, and single is the batter. Scarjo has not had a home run in the championship series of the World Series. He comes up now with an opportunity for a grand slam. With two out of the six, Pete Rickard now becomes a left-hander. Throwing in the Baltimore bullpen. Ground ball for Johnson at second base. Foul goes over to cover first, and again... The Orioles are out of trouble, leaving three more. That is ten men they have left in six innings. No runs, two hits, no errors, and three left. We've gone six complete innings. The Orioles three, the Pirates three. In the top of the seventh inning, in a 3-3 tie, it'll be the lower end now of the Baltimore order, Dave Johnson, Andy Etcheverin, and Grant Jackson. Now, since the Pirates still have this right-handed reliever on, Bruce Keeson, who uh, made his appearance in the first inning for starter Luke Walker, there's a chance, I would think, that there could be a pinch-hitting situation for Echeverin and might well also be a pinch-hitting situation for Grant Jackson. We say that because just a couple of moments ago, Oriole left-hand swinging catcher Elrod Hendricks rushed down to the Oriole bullpen. Johnson will be the leadoff man. He was hit by a Keeson pitch in the fourth inning. The Pirates have out-hit uh, the Orioles 10-4. to We've got a 3-3 tie on the top of the seventh. All right, Jim. And Bruce Keeson, who has given up just one base hit and struck out three and walked nobody, prepares to pitch the seventh. Facing Dave Johnson, throws inside, but it tipped off the bat of Johnson as he swung around to get out of the way, and it's strike one. Ed Vargo, the plate on fire tonight. Jim Odom at first, John Kibber at second, Nestor Shylock at third, Ed Sudol on the left field line, and it's with John Rice, and there's a strike. John Rice that has the big battle with first base coach Don Leppard of Pittsburgh over whether a committee hit was fair or foul. Keeson quickly ahead of Johnson, 0-2. Sidearm pitch outside at low, it's one ball, two strikes. 3-3 three to three the score. Eddie Watt now gets up to throw. Here's the Leonard, Jackson who's in, Rickard, and now Watt. Crowd quiets for the moment as tall Bruce Keeson looks into San Gian. Now ready to the 1-2 pitch. Curveball drilled out for center field. Al Oliver coming over to his right and takes it for the first time. Andy Echeverra, who hit a ball very hard to cash at second base and was thrown out of the second inning and hit the first pitch that he saw in the fourth and grounded into a double play. Up for the second time. 0 for 2. We are in the seventh inning. And in the late innings of the tie ball game, you want to guard that third base line, and that is what Rich Hefner is doing right now. Just a step or two off the back at third base, off the line. Keeson steps off the mound to rub up the ball. Pirates got all of their runs in the three run first. The Orioles did. The Pirates came back with two in the first, and the Orioles were tied in the third inning. There's a strike on the breaking pitch. 3-3. String of zeros set up by Mr. Keeson. Five thus far. Old lookout hit him right in the back. That's the third man he has hit tonight. A breaking pitch. And again, there was absolutely no chance in the world for the batter to get out of the way of the pitch. It hit him in the back. A curve coming in from behind at Baron. And the go-ahead run goes down to first base. And now I am sure that you will not see... Mr. Jackson come out, but rather, it looks like Tom Chopin. Chopin, the spray hitter, 
who hit 257 this year, did not hit a home run, had five RBIs, but he is a left-handed swinger and will come on to bat for Jackson. Jackson worked two-thirds of an inning. Walked one man and bailed at Dobson. And the Orioles out of a lot of trouble. Now we have activity in the Pirate bullpen. A right-hander. Matter of fact, two right-handers. Dave Justy, the man with all those saves during the regular season 30, plus three in the championship playoffs, and the veteran Bob Miller. Three to three the score. That's a bear down at first. Show pay the batter. Chopin has been up once before, and he is 0 for 1. Hebner is thinking Bunt comes in. The ball is inside and low. Ball 1. Hebner coming in from third base, figuring that Chopin is up there to move him along. Pat Dobson, the departed pitcher, is a dandy bunter. Jackson, the pitcher of record right now. Low. It is 2-0. An important man for Keeson and the Pirates to get if they do not get it. They will have Echebarren at least down at second base. And with the top of the batting order coming up. Auto strike. Top of the batting order features Paul Blair, who has two hits. And the third time, he's in Oliver very deep in center field. Keeson has set a series record for hitting batsmen. Eleven different pitchers hit two in a game, but nobody's ever hit three before, but Bruce has done it. Back again, swinging and missing, and a breaking pitch in under the hand. It's two balls, two strikes. They play Tom Chopin around to the left, figuring that he will not pull the ball. Big gap between left center and right field. Upside, up high, it is 3-2. High and inside. 3-2 with one out. Thought of see if Echebarren is going with just one out. Three to three, the score. Not going. Ground ball over the head of Keeson. Cash comes up with it behind second base. Goes for second base and just uh, put his foot on the back in time. Looked as if to throw, then stabbed his foot at the back and gets the front runner, Echever. Chope on the first play is at first base. And that brings up Blair, singled and scored in the first, doubled in the second. The ball was actually hit not that hard, but bounded over the head of the outfielder after taking one bounce, and then drove Oliver in the last inning on a free 2 pitch very deep in center field. Check the show pay at first base. You'll recall that in the last inning when the Pirates could not move Hernandez along with the punt, they had him stealing. Eason has now checked twice over to Tom Chope, where Bob Robertson holding him. Blair does not swing at a high pitch. Offered, but then checked his swing. It's ball one. This is indeed a pivotal game. Baltimore wins it. They lead three games to one, but only need to win one of the remaining three. Pirates win it. It's a whole new series. Outside with the pitch, it's 2-0. It would be tied at two games apiece. With the fifth game due here tomorrow afternoon at our airtime, Eastern Daylight Time, 12.45. If more games are necessary, Friday's an off day, and we resume again in Baltimore on Saturday. To know the pitch, ball is hit high and deep. Back goes Stargell. He's at the warning track near the wall and appears to have it in range and takes it to the third out. Al Oliver, Bob Robertson, and Manny Sanguin. 
Now, as far as Watt's uh, overall record was concerned during 1971, Watt won three, lost one. He had more saves than anybody out of the Oriole bullpen, 11. Appeared 35 times in relief, strictly short relief, as uh, the left-hander Pete Rickard also worked uh, in short relief. Watt worked 39 in a fraction innings and had the very best earn run average on the Orioles' staff, less than two runs a game. Watt's uh, pitching equipment, pretty simple. Fastball, slider. His slider might be his very best pitch. In the bottom of the seventh inning, he'll face Al Oliver, and here's Jim Simpson. All right, Bill O'Donnell, and another interesting statistic about Eddie Watt, in those 39 plus innings, he gave up but one home run, if you're thinking long ball. Al Oliver, perfect night. Two base hits, and an intentional walk. And he is driven in a run. Makes that two runs he's driven in. Swings at the first pitch, loses his batting helmet. And it's strike one. Oliver drove in Starchill in the first inning with a double. And then came on to score Hepner with a line drive single right in the third. Watt intentionally to load the bases in the fifth. Watt ready, back and throws again, catches the outside corner with a fastball. And quickly, Oliver is down to Ed Watt, 0 and 2. Last of the seventh inning, 3 to 3. Ball is fouled out of play, past third base, up in the seats. Well, perhaps it is with a sense of the dramatic. That baseball has given us such a game for the first night game in World Series history, and this the 398th World Series game to be played. Three to three in a ball game that has had action in nearly every half inning. And for the Pirates, in every half inning but one, Watt back and throws a breaking pitch. It's strike three, and Oliver knew it. Watt strikes out Oliver, and here comes Bob Robertson. Robertson is now 0 for 3 in the ball game. He has ground it back to the pitcher's flash and has popped out to the shortstop for Lance. When he popped out last time in the fifth inning, it was with the bases loaded and one out. Beautiful night. They were talking about rain showers. If they come, they'll have to come much later tonight. Watt ready to throw, right-handed to right-handed, ground ball, Belanger can't get to this one, it rolls on through into center field, and Roberts has his second World Series base hit. That is the 11th hit for the Pirates, and more importantly, it puts the go-ahead run on at first base with Manny Sanguia, one for three, the hitter. Sanguia possessed a fine speed for a catcher, and as we said, he is up there to swing. He walks seldom. Van Gien all year long at 19 walks. 13 times he was walked intentionally. Swinging fouls tip at the plate. 19 times he walked. 13 other times he was walked when he had nothing to do with it. They walked him intentionally. And consider that San Guillen played in 138 games and was up 533 times. You'll know that Manny is up there to swing. Dodging right-handed batter. Watt checks with the runner, Robertson, who does not have great speed. Throws a fastball. Line drive right up the middle. Base hit. Robertson will stop at second base. And now there are two on with one out and Jackie Hernandez the batter. have been on the ropes throughout this ball game. In the second inning, the seven, eight, nine batters went down in a row. Other than that, the Pirates have been something else again. They left 14 men on in Monday's game. Thus far tonight, they've left 10 men on in the three to three tie. And now we are going to have a pitch hitter. It is Vic Davalillo coming out. Davalillo, a 285 hitter during the regular season. Left-handed batter against the right-hander, Watt. Davalillo has been up one time and got a base hit and scored a run in this World Series. Rickard and Tom Dukes now up throwing. Three to three the score. You wonder what the breakthrough is going to come and by which team. Right now, the Pirates... Ready to break through. Davalillo fouls the ball at the plate. It's strike one. 
on deck is Bruce Giesen, but also the bullpen of the Pirates is busy. Just in case they want to get a big inning, they will go to the bullpen and put down Giesen for a pinch hitter. Dave Justin with the palm ball and all of those saves. Throwing hard now in the Pirate bullpen. Pirates have had 12 hits. Orioles have had four, but in the run column, thus far, it's all even, three apiece. Bob taking his time, ready with a one-strike pitch to Vic Davilio. Throws, the ball is popped up now, will come back for the seat out of play. Back at home play. Bob Robertson, down at second base, Manny Sanguian on at first. Sanguian at first does have... As we said, excellent speed, and Davileo is also possessed of good speed. It would be a difficult double play unless the ball is hard hit. Uh, of course, Robertson must move over to third, and Brooks Robertson is stationed there. Two strikes to Davileo. One out in front of Mechaber boost to the outside of the plate. The ball is thrown. The ball is popped up out in the short center field. Ball there is on its way over, and is there. He's got, he dropped the ball. Here's Robertson is stopping at third. There's a jam up on the bases. Sanguian's hung up. Sanguian is out of second. Sanguian nearly passed Robertson on the bases. And he's tagged out by Mark Belanger. Or uh, Dave Johnson tagged him. All right, here it is again. And now you're going to see this thing we told you about, those lights peering over his left shoulder. And I'm sure that bothered Blair. And he drops the ball there. Now Blair's going to pick it up quickly. And Sanguin, who's a very daring base runner, is going to be called, caught out there by Belanger and tagged out by Johnson. And that is an extremely big out as Earl Weaver again has come back to the mound. Paul Blair, you saw something unusual when he gets to a ball and can't hold on to it. He's charged with an error. Blair charged with an error, but he really made a recovery to get that ball back in the infield to the relay man, Belanger, who sized up the situation and flipped to Dave Johnson, who tagged Sanguian. Sanguian twice now has been cut down between second and third. Bob Robertson wound up at third. Milt May now, a young left-handed hitting catcher, is going to bat for Bruce Keeson. And on first is Davileo. The Orioles have just made their eighth error in the series. Boy, the Pirates certainly have had all kinds of scoring opportunities, and it's not just this game tonight, Kurt. It's been every game they've been in. Milt May hit 278 this year, six homers, 25 runs batted in. He's only 21 years old, a brilliant prospect for the future for the Pirates. Ball one. He would be playing regular on most clubs. What are they going to do with him, Bob? Are they going to make Sanguian into an outfielder? They've been talking about it, but then they tried him in the winter ball. He ran into a fence and got hit with a line drive. They don't want to try that anymore. There's a drive in the right center. It's a base hit, and the Pirates take the lead. Coming in to score is Robertson. May singles to right center. Davileo goes to third. And the Pirates, for the first time, are in the lead in this game. Well, they finally got the timely hit. And now, Gene Alley goes in to run for Milt May at first base. May gets a big hand as he trots into the Pirate dugout. He came through. That move right there, too, Kurt, will freeze Alley in the number nine spot in the batting order and allow Murtaugh to put his new pitcher, who will be Dave Justy, to come into the ball game and hit a little higher up in the order. Well, the two heroes right now, 21-year-old Bruce Keeson, who pitched a brilliant relief job tonight, 
And now Milt May, who's delivered the go-ahead single. Four to three, Pittsburgh. Two down, and Dave Cash up with runners on first and third. Eddie Watts low with it for a ball. At third is Davalillo. Gene Alley at first. The Pirates have had 13 hits. The Orioles have had four hits. Ball two, two and nothing. The 2 0 pitch, a strike with a fastball, 2 and 1. He had to select a game, Kirk Gowdy, to send all over the world for the first night telecast in the history of the World Series. I don't know how you could select a better one. That's right. That everything. There's a drive into right field that Robinson moves back for. And that's all, but the Pirates took the lead in their lucky seventh. They had one run, three hits, one error. And two left by Pittsburgh at the end of seven. It's Pittsburgh four, Baltimore three. We pause now for station identification. Justy now is on trying to protect the Pirate lead. The pitcher of record, though, for Pittsburgh is Bruce Keeson. And the 21 year old pitcher went six in the third innings in relief, allowed only one hit, no runs, didn't walk a man, struck out three, set a new World Series record by hitting three batters. He's the winner if the Pirates hold the lead. What about Dave Justy, Bob? Well, he was five and six on the year, but that doesn't really tell the story. He had 30 saves. He was the saving pitcher in the clincher for the Eastern Division title against the Cardinals. He was the saver in the clincher for the National League Championship. And against the San Francisco Giants, he appeared in all four games. Gene Alley has gone to shortstop for Pittsburgh, replacing Jackie Hernandez. Mark Belanger leading off as an infield hit him three times. A ball to him. We're in the eighth inning. That's Alley. Dusty has a fastball, breaking pitch, and a palm ball. Strike one and one. Throws that ball back out of the palm of his hand, uses that as his changeup. The Orioles have not had a hit in the last five innings. They had three runs and three hits in the first inning. They had a bloop double in the second inning, and they were stopped cold by Bruce Keeson. The 1 1 pitch, just outside. 2 and 1. 
Dave Justy led the National League in saves this year with 30. He pitched one scoreless inning in the second game of this series. 30 years old. Two on delivery. Three and one to Belanger. Three one pitch to Belanger. Right in there to him. Three and two. Notice he's up on that bat handle a couple of inches. He's out. One away in the eighth. And there's the. We told you tonight would be the largest crowd in the history of Pittsburgh baseball, and it was. 51,378. Standing room only tonight here in Pittsburgh. And the lights on in the Golden Triangle for only the fourth time in the city's history, except for the Christmas celebration, in honor of the first World Series game at night. Call one. The city of Pittsburgh downtown is a glow tonight. It'll be further a glow if the Pirates win this one. I'll go from a light on to a glow on. A 1 0 pitch. Last ball for a strike, one and one. Dave Justy attended Syracuse University, where he's an outstanding athlete and was a phys ed major there. He met his wife, Jenny, at Syracuse University, and she majored in psychology, if that tells you anything. A 1 1 pitch. Ground ball drilled to Cash at second. Over to Bob Robertson, two down. Frank Robinson. Been walked intentionally, struck out, and been hit by a pitch ball. 0 for 1. 4 to 3 Pittsburgh. Four runs, 13 hits for Pittsburgh. Three runs, four hits for Baltimore. The eighth inning, the Orioles have two down, nobody on. They're deep and way around toward left for Frank. A ball to him. Ball two. Bob Prince broke in with a great broadcaster in this town, a beloved figure, and it would be remiss if we didn't mention his name in the Pittsburgh World Series. Rosie Rosewell. We would call that pitch the old Dipsy Doodle. He surely would have. A pop up to the right side by Frank Robinson. Cash says, get out of my way. I got it. Three up and three down for Baltimore. And we're going to the last of the eighth inning as this Pittsburgh crowd goes wild with a score. Pittsburgh four, Baltimore three. Nineteen seventy one football highlights. There they are. We're doing the NFL during the regular season, the postseason, the Gator Bowl, Rose Bowl, Orange Bowl, and Senior Bowl, all on NBC. Richie Hebner up in the last of the eighth inning. And he is not hit. A ball to Hebner.
Popped the short. He singled in the third. He struck out. He lined out. Brooks Robinson making a great play on the low line drive in the sixth. One out of four for him. Flamini will follow. Foul back. Eddie Watt pitched the seventh and was stung for a run and three hits. Two balls and a strike to Hebner. There's a long drive and a deep ride backing up Robinson on the warning track right on the edge of it for the out. One down. Flamini has struck out single to right single to center and walk two for three. I swear he's going to twist that that neck off sometime, Bob. Yes, and he's only started to do that in the last uh, month or so. Jesus Alou, you'll recall, has that. He has a nerve affliction, and Bobby uh, just does that. Well, you talked yesterday about his 12 pressure points. He's a real student of anatomy, and particularly his own. Four to three. Pittsburgh ahead in the last of the eighth. The Pirates went ahead in the last of the seventh. One out, nobody on. A strike to Clemente. The Orioles got three runs in the first. The Pirates bounced back with two. The Pirates tied it in the third. And then went ahead in the seventh. Clemente played well over to right again. Powell guarding the first baseline, a bounding ball. A long throw here by Belanger off balance. And not in time, Clemente beats it out. That's his third hit of this game. That is the fourth hit off Watt. And that is the 14th hit by the Pirates. And here comes Earl Weaver. As Sargill comes up, Rickard has been working. Sargill is a left-handed swinger. Rickard's a left-handed thrower. And this could be all for Eddie Watt. Weaver taking a little dive and now tells Ed Watt that he is through. Watt can be the losing pitcher. Came on in the seventh inning. Has worked one and a third innings. Given up a run. Responsible, of course, for Clemente at first base. Four base hits, struck out one, and walked no one. And Bill, here comes Speed Rickard. Clemente's down at first base with one out of the eighth inning. Four to three, the Pirates. They win this one. We've got at least a six-game World Series. Even at 2 2. Record throw, strike one. Pete is in his third series game. He's 31 later on this month. How many off at first base? Rickard looks at him and then throws a ground ball foul by Boo Powell at first base. Bounds on to fair territory now, and Frank Robinson will have to retrieve it out of deep right field. Two strikes to start with. Robinson has retrieved the ball, and Rickard is ready to throw as Frank takes his position, waving that he's ready. Oh, with two to Stargell. Stargell has two hits and four attempts tonight. One of them, a run-scoring double. Takes a breaking pitch, and it's strike three, and Stargell sits down. On three pitches, Rickard strikes out Willie Stargell. That's the sixth pirate to go down. And here is Al Oliver, who is two for three plus a walk and has driven in a couple of runs. Another left-handed batter, and he takes high with a fastball from Rickard. It's small one. Clemente on at first base as a result of the infield hit. Belanger going back on the turf in the hole at short. Throwing off balance, could not get the speedy Roberto Clemente. Rickard throws, catches the outside batter with a breaking pitch. It's one ball, one strike to Al Oliver. On deck, Bob Robertson. We are in the last of the eighth. The Pirates lead it by a run and would like more. Fastball is outside. It's two and one. Rickard did not appear in the championship series against Oakland. Matter of fact, he hasn't worked since September the 28th against Boston. Tonight's two starting pitchers have not worked in three weeks. Luke Walker, long since gone, since September the 22nd. Pat Thompson now gone, September 24th. 
Pitches outside at 3-1. Dave McNally, who opened and won the first World Series game, will pitch tomorrow. His opponent will be Nelson Bryles, who has not pitched since September the 30th, only three innings then, and had a full thigh muscle in his last appearance against the Phillies. Three and one, Rickard right back, fastball, left field, where Burr Bretman moves in a couple of steps, and now back and to his right, and has it for the third out. No runs, one hit, no error, one left. The goal for eight innings. The Orioles have one more chance in the ninth with Robinson, Powell, and Johnson. At the end of eight, Pittsburgh four, Baltimore three. Simpson, Bill O'Donnell back with you at Pittsburgh Three River Stadium. Dave Justy about to start his second inning in relief. And he will initially face two men with long ball power, Brooks Robinson and Boo Powell. And uh, excuse a little bit of guessing time in the NBC radio booth. Etchebarren is the fourth two batter here in the top of the ninth inning. They could bat Hendricks if they get that far for Etchebarren. Brooks Robinson 0 for 2 plus a sacrifice fly swings at the first hit. Ball at strike one. Well, the most valuable player in the World Series a year ago, Brooks Robinson, against a premier reliever in the National League, Dave Justy, ninth inning with the Pirates leading by a run. Justy right back, misses outside and low, and it's one ball, one strike. Big move, pound with one base hit. But two balls, well hit tonight, waits on deck in this four to three game. We are in the ninth. Justy back with another foul ball down low. Brooks, deep, then swung around to the left. Bob Miller up and throwing in case the Orioles do tie the game. One, two, ground ball toward Alley and shortstop. Waits for the second out. Guns the throw on to Robinson. One out. The Pirates are two outs away from tying the World Series. Manny Tangi and walks back, pounding that glove out in front of the plate. Urging Justy on as big boo pal who drove Oliver very deep with a sacrifice fly to the wall in the first inning. Foul out in the fourth, and in a heart smash at Robertson Club down at first base in the sixth is up again. Now, with 22 home runs, 92 RBIs during the regular season, battling that injured right hand. And he'll be looking long ball, just he knows it, as he winds to throw. Changed on the pitch, and it's outside ball one. Four runs, 14 hits, no errors for the Pirates. Who left 12 men on base. Three runs, four hits, one error for the Orioles. Who have only left four men on base. They have not had many opportunities. Another change outside and way high. It is 2-0. The Orioles' only real threat was in the first inning when they collected all three runs. They left a man on in the second, another in the sixth, another in the seventh. Bruce Keeson was simply superb. Six and a third innings, one base hit, struck out three, walked nobody. Hit three batters. As he was a hero in the final game of the National League Championships, Keeson could be the big hero again tonight. Powell steps out on Justy, who was already in his windup. Of course, he had called time before. Dave stares around, now looks into his catcher, Sandy. Two and zero the count to Powell comes in. It's up high off the glove of Sandian, and it is three and zero. Crowd becomes a little apprehensive. Pirates lead it by a run, four to three. Ninth inning. Big tall Dick Hall now up and throwing in the Pirates bullpen. Three and zero pitch, and there's strike one. And Powell was taking all the way. Three and one the count. He took down, uh, looked down at Billy Hunter, who simply turned his back on him. Now comes back, flashing the signs, and Powell steps back in. 12.45 Eastern time, fifth game tomorrow from Three River Stadium. Three and one the count. Drive, it is popped up. Foul territory. In comes Hefner. By Sandy in, chases it down and passes. Peter Buck to Dave Johnson. The last hope for the Orioles come up, comes up, as it is now. Unless Johnson comes through, the Orioles will be tied in their series with the Pirates after winning the first two. And we have a certainty of a six-game series and going back to Baltimore. But the Orioles are still alive at the top of the line. 
with two out and John for the batter against Justy. Swing, drive, one hop to Alley. He's up with it, throws on the first.